Hello everyone, welcome back to Ask a Scientist Gaming, where we combine mediocre gameplay and expert science. I'm Ken Hansen, Associate Professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at Florida State University. I'm a photochemist slash photophysicist. I shine light on molecules and I want to track what happens to that with spectroscopic techniques and then do use something useful with that energy. But more importantly, joining me today is Dr. Tanya Paris. Tanya, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Sure. Hi. Thanks, Ken. I'm a professor and the chair of anthropology uh, at Florida State University. I'm an archaeologist and I study animal bones from archaeological sites to look at what people ate in the past and also how they may have incorporated animals into other parts of their lives. Um, that's kind of evolved into going more holistically towards foodways. So I'm interested in what not only what people eat, but how they cooked it and how they stored it and how they served it and disposed of it. And what do you teach typically? Um, let's see. I teach anything from intro to archaeology, which is one of our bigger classes, to uh, foodways archaeology, advanced zooarchaeology. Um, this semester, that's what I taught this semester for grad students. But I also teach like um, the pro seminar class for our grad students. And I developed a class a few years ago called Thesis Boot Camp um, <laughs> for the graduate students so that we could, you know, all get on the same page about what needed to happen um, on the timeline to get them to graduation. Uh, that's fair. There's not a lot of guidance. All right. Equally important. What game are we starting with tonight? I believe we're starting with Galaga. Galaga. But I have to do one quick thing. Yep. <laughs> that's for my son <laughs> the gamer wanted <laughs> g-man gt40 there you go you there got your you go. shout out on screen <laughs> <laughs> now let's play some galaga to totally worth it <laughs> Yeah, so those of you not familiar, Galaga was one of the all-time classic arcade games. We're playing it on the NES version. So this is uh, ported to the Nintendo, playing with a Nintendo Entertainment System controller. So no joystick on this one. I apologize. But, yeah, so go ahead and press start. Mm -hmm. Classic soundtrack as well. So this when is... was the last time you played some Galaga? Ooh. <laughs> Sometime in the 80s, 1980s. Uh, yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> Either that, maybe one, maybe I've played like one time at, um, what's the arcade down in Railroad Square? Flippin' Great Pinball. Yeah. Yeah, no, I love that place. It's like you pay by the hour, right? It's not, it's not I, a quarter eater. I don't know. I went with my daughter to a birthday party. <laughs> they had <laughs> right, rented they out the whole place. Out. So yeah, um, we just got to play all kinds of I taught her how to play Pac-Man. It was really fun. Yeah. Flipping great pinball. But they have some modern games there, like um, Cuphead and things like that. So yeah, you guys should check it out. If you're in, if you're in the Tallahassee area, yeah. enjoy Railroad Square while it still lasts. Mm -hmm. See what happens with the building renovations. All right. Um, so different. So I was an undergraduate here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in yeah, the yeah. 90s. And it's so Railroad Square was really different then. Yeah. I mean, not, was it still a railroad depot? I don't know. Um, it was mostly of. just abandoned warehouses. Mm -hmm. And um, it was it could be pretty scary and sketchy. Mm -hmm. I did have friends that got married there in one of the warehouses. And, um, and I remember it was like august and it was the hottest wedding i've ever been to because of course there's no air condition in yeah warehouses. and you're in a, a greenhouse essentially it's pretty bad yeah and that's pretty fun and it, even in the last I've, I've been here 10 years it's been dramatic i mean they've yeah. significantly changed and now they've sold out large portions to commercial all those hotels I mean, the, the the first hotel they built wasn't too obtrusive, but I, they're they're taking over major portions. So mm -hmm. we'll see what happens next. <laughs> Sorry, it's very, it's very fun. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly. Mom. We have mixed responses on uh, on gameplay. It's like you just submerge yourself in it, and the, the, the science is a side note. What's up, G? I showed your sign. Did you see it? <laughs> If not, it'll be on the YouTube video. That's so. right. You can show your friends. Ah, get your friends to tune in, Graham. <laughs> we need more follows. Click the follow button. Right. <laughs> follow, like, subscribe, so on and so forth. Just we kidding. We're going to be for fun. very popular with the middle school crowd. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, there it is. Shmuel with the with the follow. Thank you for the follow. Oh, we hey, Shmuel. It. Is that one of yours as well? Oh, I met him today for the first time, actually. He is a student at FSU. 
Wow. He is um, studying microeconomics, and he is going to become a lawyer, a labor union lawyer, wow. of all things. Shout Pretty out, cool. Shout out to you. We could use that in uh, Florida right now. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you know, railroad Square is still pretty cool. Some friends and I went exploring the abandoned railroad. Yeah, no, I love Railroad Square. We do. We used to do a in-person Ask a Scientist there. So inside the barn that's like in the center where the like lemonade shop and uh, I think they sell burgers now, we just had four or five scientists in there like drinking alcohol and asking, answering questions to the general public. And so, yeah, if you're at Railroad Square, swing by on first Friday and check out the in-person Ask a Scientist. But yeah, I love that space. The, the video game space plus the flipping great pinball. Yeah, pretty fun. Yeah. All right, you've had a little time to settle into the gameplay. A couple minutes. Sure. So uh, <laughs> one of the ones we'd like to start with, because our journey is very so dramatically. Um, mm. So presumably, like, seven-year-old Tanya wasn't like, I'm going to become an archaeologist and study food ways. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> there, was, there was a path that led you to where you are. What were the major, like, milestones that oh. first pointed you towards science and then narrowed your focus down to your particular domain of expertise? Okay, so I think... Yeah, when I was yeah, when I was probably like 10, 12, I took this I had well, I was in the gifted program at my middle school and our teacher was really big on experiential learning and outside the box type teaching activities and so we did all kinds of things, marine biology and forest conservation, but he had an archaeologist um, come to our class from the University of Florida and the Florida Museum of Natural History and um, do a mock dig with us and, you know, talk to us about what archaeology was. It was very, very cool. I should give a shout out to Mr. Herrera. Um, <laughs> he was the, the middle school science teacher that we all loved. And so that was part of it. And then it also coincided with... Um, an exhibit at one of the local museums, maybe Jacksonville Museum, that was Egyptian in theme. And, you know, Egyptian um, artifacts are very exciting to look at and very different than things that we know or see in our daily lives. And so that was really exciting to go to that. And then <laughs> the perfect storm, the trifecta, was the first Indiana Jones movie came out that year. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and it just was like, wow. I mean, real Indiana Jones, that's not necessarily what we do in archaeology but still it was very exciting yeah, right yeah and um so that was that's how that was what really tipped me off and i can remember even in high school like that's what i wanted to do and talking about that's what i wanted to do um and then i got to college i came to florida state and i declared education as my major because my family thought you'll never get a job as an archaeologist it's not a real thing it is a real thing kids <laughs> um and and so then I switched my major after my first anthropology class in my, I think, second semester, first semester, something like that, and have not looked back since. That's, so that's how I started as the young, novice, newbie archaeologist. Mm -hmm. um, Tallahassee is really great for archaeology. We probably have more archaeologists per capita in this city than any other place in Florida, maybe even the southeast. Because we, as the state capital, have all the state agency offices here, right? Oh, I see. But also a bunch of federal ones, too. Um, and the Southeastern Archaeological Center of the National Park Service um, is is here. It's located based here, and it's based here because of FSU. So FSU is like the host institution for it. And um, there are a ton of archaeologists that work for SEAC. I worked for SEAC as an undergrad and a master's student. And got a lot of really good experience um, working with them in some really unusual situations because they take care of all the national parks in the southeast. And um, I think, oh, there are also like private cultural resource management firms here um, that employ a lot of archaeologists. So it's it's a really good place to to work. A lot of there's a thriving archaeology community, professional and avocational. I mean, also a rich Native American history in the region, too, yes, right? That's, we do. That's really, I mean, you don't have to study where you work, but it, it it's helps. It's convenient. Right? Yeah. It does. And I mean, it's actually really interesting to live on the land of the people that you're studying or, you know, trying to find out about. So we're not actually studying, like, the people as research subjects so much as trying to understand things that happened in the past with them mm -hmm. um and particular here it's the um Appalachian indians that were here before european contact and then when the spanish came both 
you know, Narvaez, DeSoto, and then eventually um, Franciscan friars came and and created mission sites. Oh, the tractor beam got me. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, rage. Yeah. We got a rage emote, don't worry. Created um, <laughs> missions, and uh, that was a whole thing. And that's actually, the, those are the sites I'm working at right now. Um, there, there's a bunch of them locally, and, and I'm work, I've am i worked at Mission San Luis, which is the big one. Mm -hmm. But um, the one I'm working at currently is, is one that no one has worked at professionally before. FSU. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. New information. It's privately owned. Stuff. Yeah. And the, the landowner is amazing. He's such a good, him and his wife are both very good stewards of um, the resources on their property mm -hmm. and very interested in learning more and wanting us to, you know, help them learn more, which is pretty cool. Do you ever wonder if Jurassic Park came out instead of Indiana Jones, if you'd be digging up dinosaurs right now? Good question. Um, you know, I didn't do great in my historical geology class. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. I don't think so. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know. I I also liked English, mm -hmm. um, at, like literature as a major. But yeah, in terms of narrowing your expertise, that was during grad school. Like when you entered grad school, you kind of picked a path, or when did that transition happen? Okay, good question. Yeah, sorry, I'm getting kind of caught up in the game. Yeah, here. no, this happens. My, <laughs> my job is to keep you on track. Um, okay, so as an undergrad, right, I switched into anthropology and um, to become an archaeologist. And I took classes, and I was like, oh, I like everything that I took. Um, I took a really awesome archaeological field school here. Um, and it, when I took it as an undergrad, it was in the full spring semester, right, 16 weeks of field work <laughs> at a local mission site. Wow. Um, at one of the sites here locally. And so you learned a lot and, um, and I liked what I was doing, but I still hadn't quite found my niche. And it wasn't until that, um, next fall, I took a class called paleo nutrition, which, um, can mean a lot of different things. But in this case, it was learning how to identify animal remains from archaeological sites. Hmm. So these are, you know, most of the time, like crumbs and fragments and little tiny pieces of animals. And you have to learn how to identify them to class and to taxa and, you know, genus, species, and the element and the parts of the element and all kinds of craziness. Um, it's really fun. And it was just, I was hooked. It's like hmm. a puzzle. Um, and I love puzzles, so I was like, "This is what I want to do." And mm -hmm. that, I was an undergrad, so I, I, you know, took the class, and then I continued to do independent studies and, and independent research with my major advisor. Um, and then I applied for the master's program and, and was accepted, and so I continued doing that for my master's. Um, and actually, my master's thesis was on a very different site. Um, it's actually a submerged site in the Osceola River <laughs> and it's a Paleo-Indian site so it dates now we know it dates to 14,500 um, and there are you know, extinct megafauna and things there but I was looking at the smaller fauna like deer and turtles and birds and fishes and stuff and that was really fun that was my master's thesis um, and it was it was really interesting I thought I would I might go that direction in terms of like time period and um, you know, submerged sites and, and whatnot. Then I went to the University of Florida uh, for my PhD. I call that my necessary evil. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I suppose you were an undergrad here. You yeah. Well, oh, about yeah. About you're you're heavily indoctrinate, indoctrinated <laughs> as an undergrad. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went there and, you know, I'm still doing zooarchaeology, but my major advisor worked in Panama. Um, and so I was able to go down to Panama uh, several summers with her and some students and other people. And I ended up with a fellowship with the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute that is based down there in the canal zone and um, worked at a pretty awesome site on the Asuero Peninsula, which is on the Pacific side. It's a, it was a pre-ceramic, it's called a shell midden site. Basically it's, um, a site where people, you know, were living in a village and disposed of their trash, and that's what a midden is. It's basically trash that builds up over time, and 
you know, when it's that old, it's organic and it's, it's not like the kind of trash we think of today, like, you know, our smelly trash dumps. Um, and so I, I worked there for a summer excavating and, and working in a makeshift lab at night. And then, um, got to go work at the Smithsonian there for a few weeks after the field work and then came back to Gainesville and finished up my dissertation. And it was all about, you know, what people were eating. And, and that's, that's like one of the basic building blocks of zooarchaeological research is what, what were people eating? Mm. Um, and it was really probably in somewhere in like 2004, 2005, that I was, I started to become interested in not only what people ate, but what animals were we finding that people were not eating mm. and why were we finding them? Like, what would that mean? So I've been working on, um, a number of different projects for the last 15 years, I guess, with, one of my friends who's a cultural anthropologist and a linguist, and we have an ethnozoarchaeology project that we've been working on, and we've published a couple of papers about. One's about um, hunting amulets that are deer antler pieces, hmm. and another one is about the use of bear grease um, by the Cherokee, which is pretty cool. And uh, yeah, so we we have been working on trying to find other ways that people may have been incorporating animals into their worldview and, and, you know, as other types of resources. So that's kind of where I started. Oh, uh, that makes sense. So Schmiel followed up. Uh, Mission St. Louis was worth the visit. My friend and I visited together. So uh, info for a prehistory paper. It was neat to see the place where Appalachian Spanish lived together for a time. Describing it as prehistory is interesting. Is that a term in your field or is that? Um, it is still, unfortunately, it's one of the, like, nobody likes it, but everybody knows what it means. Yeah. So, um, because it means something very specific here mm -hmm. um, in the Americas, it basic prehistory basically means um, looking at societies and cultures that, that didn't have a written language that they left behind, at least that we could understand. Yeah. Um, now that like people like the Maya and the Aztecs, they had a written language, right? It was hieroglyphics mm -hmm. type um, language. And and so I wouldn't c call them prehistoric necessarily. So we also have like pre-Columbian or pre-European contact. I see, I see. Um, trying to, you know, differentiate because it, it's it's not as, you know, cut and dry, right? As, as I think people first thought when they came up with prehistoric and historic. Yeah. They really were basing that on historic being like the english colonial period yeah. in, in the u.s i was gonna say that's very imperialist like history didn't exist until we did right exactly <laughs> you can't write it down then it must not be history yeah but you know there's all kinds of ways to record history besides just writing it down yeah I we mean, have, memories we have some people in like the the solar cell and energy conversion community that use words like pre or um non-legacy world mm. and then they just refer to legacy it's Europe and US and whatnot, but everyone has a legacy. I hate to break it to you. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get to define that based on your particular industrial revolution. It's so, very ethnocentric. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, and it's it's something we do probably subconsciously more than we think. Right. You absorb it when you're, you know, learning all of the parts of your field, your discipline, mm -hmm. and then if you don't stop to question it, because sometimes you, you don't because you're so just involved in what you're doing that it just kind of keeps perpetuating itself. But yeah, if you can stop and question those types of terms, you can be like, yeah, what are we really trying to say here? What do we mean? Um, you know, how is that affecting how we think about um, the topics that we're studying and how other people may want to or not want to interact with us because of that? Words I mean, matter. I mean, so along that vein, like I'm just waiting for the first teacher to tell me evolution isn't real to my daughters, right? Like, mm -hmm. so, so have you experienced that in terms of history and how it's recounted in our education system? Oh, sure. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, I worked in Tennessee for 10 years. Okay. And um, the war of Northern aggression. <laughs> <laughs> Not a civil war. For example. There. <laughs> um, but I, I had colleagues that would have students like in their class verbalize that, you know, evolution was not true and that they were teaching false doctrine. Mm -hmm. um, I never had anyone actually ever verbalize it to me. I did have some comments on student evaluations, though, which hmm. I thought was pretty interesting. Um, and it's just one of those. I mean, it probably, I don't know, 
I, I teach that as like, this is what it is. This is what the word means. This mm-hmm. is what, you know, we mean when we're talking about evolution and, um, and just try to present it in a really straightforward manner that kind of takes emotion out of things. And, you know, it really, it's not my job to make anybody believe or whatever. My job is to give you the facts and make your own decision. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of where it went. Yeah, no, that's intriguing. Oh. Yeah, Shmuel, it is interesting that the course is called World Prehistory, um, but that is, that's an, an outdated name. For sure. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, but that's... also a pain in the ass to change because you have to do a lot of bureaucracy. So. <laughs> right. We have. It's like you know, my colleagues and I talk about like, oh, we should we should update names of these courses, and it's a great idea. And then we all get you know involved in all the things that happen during a semester, and no one has time because you have to, as you said, and you have a lot of paperwork to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's non-trivial. So you have to justify being the same course number but a different name. Right. <laughs> We've played this game before, so. Yep. Um, yeah, Schmuel following up, um, a professor I took history from recently critiqued her own material for being ethnocentric for Europe. I mean, it's a fair self-reflection. Mm-hmm. And, that, and the hard part is, like, we have to pick and choose what we focus on. Too. Right. And it's, there's no catch-all to teach all, it just, it's, it's hard. <laughs> Cuddle Puppy. Go in the air. Cuddle Puppy's one of our regulars and a bit of a troll. How do you try to capture escaped velociraptors? You think you've cornered one, but then its friend ambushes you and you say clever girl and get mauled. Well, <laughs> depends. I mean, are you using like raw tuna or, you know, what are you using to try to lure the velociraptors in? That may be the problem. <laughs> oh, Cuddle Puppy, you might have missed it. Indiana Jones is the archaeology theme of the evening. That, that's what, what that's what turned Tanya on to the entire discipline. I like um, I like the question, let's just, or the comment, let's call it pre-Galaga. <laughs> that's not old enough <laughs> yeah exactly has to be more than 50 years it, old it's, it's old enough for most of our audience actually Actually, when was Gal- galaga come out oh the first one it had to it have been in the 80s right yeah yes. it would have been early 80s the arcade came or out s- this is probably 86 78 maybe yeah oh every chance i get cuddle puppy every <laughs> chance i get my uh, G-Man wants to know what you're running the game off of. Uh, so G-Man, we have several emulators. So basically every every two weeks I have a new guest on and I send them an email saying, what games do you want to play? And they send me a list and I find hopefully ways to do it. Uh, we have a whole bunch of different emulators. The one we're using right now is the, the, the FCEUX. So I don't know how you pronounce that, but that's the NES one that's accepted for speed running. And we just run ROMs off of that. But no, we do have, I literally have a wall full of Nintendo games, and this is on the shelf, but it doesn't capture well on the video card, so we don't use original hardware. So yeah, we're playing uh, uh, emulators for most of the Ooh, games. Here they come! <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't ready! No, no rest here. <laughs> How often do you point bazookas at Nazi battalions? So I said every chance I get. What, what is that a reference to? Um, Which game is that? Arche- well, you said Indiana Jones was our oh, theme. Oh, I see, I see, I see. And, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. archaeologists punch Nazis in the face. <laughs> and use a whip regularly. Oh, yes. <laughs> that's, that's actually a class in the archaeology. Right. <laughs> Proper <laughs> use and care of your whip. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Keep it shiny. <laughs> Uh, I'm only now realizing how bad I am at Galaga. Well, if it makes you feel any better, we are cheating. We do have infinite lives. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll keep playing until Tanya gets sick of it, and then we'll move on to another game. But we should probably open with a, uh, a prediction of some kind. Just oh, that's for a fun. good idea. Um, which one do you want to do? This is the first, first one. one. All right. We're going to talk about animals and... We... Oh, the timeline on that. Well, that's, that'll be our discussion point afterwards. The fedora doesn't look good on the camera. It's, it hides my face too much. I'm answering Cuddle Puppy's questions. They're yeah. funny. All right, we're going to throw a prediction up there now. If you guys haven't followed the stream before, um, typically predictions are used to predict outcomes of video games. Not on this channel. We ask science questions related to our guests. In fact, they send me five or six uh, uh, science questions ahead of time, and we pop those up. So if you guys aren't following us, click the follow button. One, it helps with visibility of the channel and helps us with our popularity. But two, 
You get 300 pretend internet points. We call them standard internet units on our channel. And you get to gamble those points, not gamble if you know the answer, to science questions. So I'm gonna pop up a science question right now. At the top of your chat, you'll see a button that says predict. Cl click that predict button and you can pick an answer to this question. Which is the first domesticated animal? Was it a dog or was it a pig? Which one was the first domesticated by humans, dogs or pigs? And domesticated in this context means cohabitated with humans? Um, no, domesticated in this context means um, altered to the point where it is its separate species from the wild. Oh, that's intriguing. Progenitor. That is a fun, fun dividing criteria for <laughs> domestication. <laughs> Cuddle puppy. Fedoras are good for character <laughs> introductions because yes. you can stand dramatically with your head down and tilt the brim up and face reveal. <laughs> Cuddle puppy, you got it down to an art. I will remember that for next time. Yeah. Well, <laughs> new, new Indiana Jones movie coming out sometime I, soon. I'm excited. I, I I have mixed feelings. Like people were super upset about the Crystal Skull. Oh, that they, was terrible. I mean, it was, but like they're like invoking aliens. That's wrong. But invoking right. voodoo and like Nazi, like <laughs> it was <laughs> all kinds of bad It's stuff. all absurdity, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you historical purists. They, they basically <laughs> just threw everything at the wall. Yeah. And said, what will stick? Yeah, we'll see what happens with the new one. And hopefully it's better. All right, you guys have about 40 seconds left. Which animal was first to be domesticated? Was it a dog or was it a pig? And domesticated means uh, actual uh, uh, speciation species. Mm -hmm. in this case. Yeah, the threshold of actually breeding them to the point of being sufficiently different. That's a fun yeah. question. I look forward to hearing like the progression because we got progressively more and more animals over time through these domestication processes. We did, but not as many as you think we might, right? Mm -hmm. Because there are so many animals out there in the world that we didn't domesticate. That's true, which was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I know, seriously, I want I want a pygmy manatee or something. <laughs> exactly. Why do we not domesticate Just, the manatee? You know. <laughs> You know, everyone needs a giant bathtub. All right. right. <laughs> Which was the first domesticated animal? Tanya, what's the answer? It's dog. Woof, woof. Dogs. We turned wolves into dogs. Is that the... Possibly, or they turned us into something. Out of <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are they exploiting us or are we exploiting them? Well, I think the prevailing theory right now is that um, the wolves... Right, that were hanging around human campsites or communities, found sometimes easy places to get food, and became more comfortable around humans. You know how they always say, don't feed wild animals, mm -hmm. and they're not afraid of humans. Well, that's what happened, and they kept hanging out, and then who knows, like maybe a mother was, a, you know, abandoned her puppies, or she was killed or something, and someone took them in because puppies are so cute and adorable. And we like cute and adorable as humans, and uh, you start raising them as your own, and they become very friendly towards humans. And then, you know, it's just a repeating cycle for dogs, anyway. Um, so I think dogs really, we, we came, we grew up together as, as um, an evolution. Because they did us a lot of favors, right? They ward off predators, or they let you know when there's someone um coming or another animal they're good for helping with hunting what else can dogs do they help get rid of waste in terms of like you know food trash and stuff mm -hmm. you don't really want that stuff hanging around your your village because that just attracts all kinds of pest animals mm -hmm. um and so that you know dogs would take care of that no problem i have a dog if you have a dog you know what i'm talking about <laughs> Congratulations to Reese's Pieces on dog and betting big on it. So congratulations on that answer. So what's the rough timeline on that? What's the... Um, I've seen recently like 100,000 years ago. 100,000? I'm, I'm... I don't know. Also, I mean... So fire was what? Like 700,000 or mm -hmm, something, something like, like that? Something like that, yeah. It's... I mean, I'm and surprised that didn't happen. Or I guess... Well, we just don't have the evidence, the yeah, right? Okay. Um... And of course, so that's the thing with archaeology. It's like we can only say something is so old if we have the evidence for it. Yeah. It could be older. 
That's interesting. So, I mean, is the general consensus this is the earliest known date? Is that how yes. it's kind of framed? Yes. That's and intriguing. and the thing with domestication, when it's defined as speciation, we yeah. are only seeing the end product, mm -hmm. right? We're not seeing the process. So, I think of the process as more like cultural domestication and that, you know, you bring animals in and they're they're friendly and they're you're maybe taming them. Um but they're not fully domesticated in a biological sense. So so how long were pigs after that? Not too well. Pigs were So were they were pigs second? Is that the No, I know? just came up with that one. Do you have a I, I don't know if you can do this off the top of your head, but the sequence of animal domestication. It's um pigs. yeah, so dog of course was the first, the oldest, everywhere everyone had domesticated dogs. Um it's pretty crazy. They really have adapted well to human society, mm -hmm. um, human company. And then the next was very likely, I think, sheep or goat. Mm. Um, you know, I think Fertile Crescent area. And then, man, thank, I'm really thankful for infinite lives right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it got hard, though. <laughs> You're probably um, in the end stages. I don't know how high this goes, but. Yeah. Um, Okay, so after sheep, goat, pig. Pig is one that gets domesticated um, pretty early um, from Asia. Mm -hmm. Cow also um, is roughly around the same time. And it's all after the domestication of things like wheat mm. and rice and barley. So, it, so plants are domesticated first and then animals. I mean, so what's what's easier? I guess relative timeline is easier to determine, or absolute timeline in these cases. I guess it depends on what your evidence is. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. I mean, if you're doing absolute radiocarbon dating, mm -hmm. AMS, that kind of stuff is very useful and you know revolutionized archaeology when um, it became reliable enough to be used, and it's even better now than it ever was. I mean, we're looking at like standard deviations of like 20 years, which is amazing. That's crazy. Yeah. So when did that innovation hit your community? Uh, was... Well, it started for archeology span in like 1954. Okay. Which is what, <laughs> so here's a fun fact. Mm -hmm. um, 1954 is the date that archeologists use for the start of before present. <laughs> It's the cutoff for before present. Present is 1954 when radiocarbon dating started. Okay, that's like that present crazy? archaeology is that's the threshold. Yes. Yeah. So when we talk about something that's 10,000 years before present, it's 10,000 years before 1954. Wow. So technique innovation is year zero in that in that bookkeeping. Yes. That's really fun. Yep. It's that's a fun fact. Yeah. No, oh, that's really fun. It's a, somebody should have requested that as a fact. All right, Shmuel uh, has a follow-up on that uh, discussion. Do you know why ancient Egyptian religion so heavily involved animals? <laughs> Lay cats. <laughs> why, why was... I, maybe IE cats? Uh, is it IE or is it Lay cats? It's the internet. It could go either way. I know. I can't really tell. Um, so most... Most many religions involve animals. Some way, some shape, somehow. He means IE. IE. <laughs> um, but I, lay cats is good too. Um, and so, why did the Egyptians choose cats? I don't know. I'm not an Egyptologist, even though I find um, Egyptian society and history very fascinating. Um, that I don't know why they chose cats, but they did. And they really incorporated them really heavily. But then there are other. Um, Groups like the Olmec, who are the predecessors to the Maya in Mesoamerica, and they heavily incorporate things like jaguars, um, which is a big cat, right? <laughs> but also a very dangerous animal for them. Um, they weren't keeping them like the Egyptians were. I mean, that's intriguing. I mean, a lot of religions have some sort of iconic animal of some kind. I mm -hmm. mean, even Christianity chose a snake for... A certain portion of their dogma and a peace versus and a um a dove for peace yeah right to mean hope and peace so yeah i mean animals are are heavily used as symbols in human society which is something that i'm super interested in like what animals what you know what makes them the symbol what do they symbolize <laughs> And again, it started with some person just saying, these are cool. <laughs> and then it expanded and infiltrated an entire culture. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely amazing. That's really fun. 
All right, we started the movie dialogue a little bit talking about Indiana Jones and Jurassic Park, and one of our one of our favorite, at least my favorite questions on the stream is like, you've you've seen movies where archaeology is invoked. I mean, which which were the movies or TV shows that got it right, and which ones got it wrong? And even partial credit to some movies we'll, we'll take. <laughs> um, I feel like they all have got it wrong. <laughs> Like, well, we'll start with what's the most accurate depiction of archaeology you've ever seen on film? The dig. The dig. I don't know if I've seen the dig. What is that? It's on Netflix. Mm. And it's about the um, discovery of the of Seton Ho, which was a Viking ship that was buried on land. Right. Mm -hmm. It was a burial, um, human burial and a boat burial. And it's in someone's like field, and um, the guy who ends up excavating it is not a professional archaeologist, but he's very good at excavating and very much cares for the resource um, and you know keeping it safe and treating it properly. Um, and it's it's very good. There's a scene with blue tarps that <laughs> if you're a professional archaeologist, you're like, oh, yeah, the tarps. Because you cover things up with tarps when it rains. Yeah. <laughs> and if it starts raining when you're out in the field, like unexpectedly, or, or, or you know it's going to rain, but you're always, you know, playing chicken with the rain. How much more work can we get done kind of thing? Mm -hmm. And then you start running around to cover with plastic or tarps. That's that's pretty much what what he was doing in the dig so that's the most accurate representation that was awesome. the dig the dig all right i'll have to look that up so who got it way wrong the mummy <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about that was a documentary <laughs> film right. i mean it's a fun movie but it's uh that and La lara croft i mean i th guess tomb raider is a movie right i have never yeah. seen it but um from the thing i've never seen the whole thing the things that i have seen are definitely um no. <laughs> Not a thing. All right. Not accurate representations of the uh, <laughs> the profession. Right. So what did they get wrong? What was the... Just, it's very sensationalized, and it's very, like, smash and grab. Yeah. Um, I mean, and... they really like the discovery moment. How, how often do you actually get those? Do you get those? Or we is it do. a very subtle process? Well, you get them, but, you know, the things that we tend to think of as exciting discoveries are not movie-worthy. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, like this past summer, I was working at this um, Appalachian Spanish mission site that we know, if it's the site that we think it is, it was burned in, in 1647 because it was the first um, site or first battle of the Appalachian Revolt of 1647. And they burned the church and, and other buildings at the mission. And so as we were... You know, excavating, we had lots of burned clay and stuff. Mm. Um, and then, I, you know, I had a lot of students out there with me working, and the students were fabulous. And we found in situ burned posts, like burned timbers from whatever building was there. Mm. Um, and it's, you know, they're like huge chunks of them in the post pits. That is exciting. But, you know, the average person on the street is like, it's burned wood. <laughs> but They're not wrong. <laughs> it's, but it's burned wood that no one has touched yeah. in hundreds of years. And it has very important context. Yes. So it's, it's pretty fun. Yeah, that's that's fun. I guess a follow up on that. What was your like, I made it as an archaeologist moment? Was it a dig or was it a, a processing or contextualizing? Like, mm. what was your... When I could afford a refrigerator with an automatic ice maker. <laughs> um, what was my, I don't, probably, I don't know. I don't know that I've had an exact moment mm -hmm. because when it happens, it's, it always seems kind of anticlimactic, you know, because yeah. all the work and the build up to things, but things like, um, traveling to other countries to mm. either do field work or to give talks or um, I've taught study abroad in Scotland and ended up doing research in Scotland, which was pretty fantastic. And I'm ready to go back whenever they will have me. <laughs> um, so that to me is, is one of the reasons I really liked anthropology because it was a chance to see things that I wouldn't see in my own personal life and that most people don't get to see. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's about how humans lived in the past. And that is so fascinating to me. So that, and also I think when I published my first book mm. was pretty big and exciting. Um, yeah. 
first ten yeah. time job. So uh, exciting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Affording a fridge is like that, that's one of those life I've made it moments. Yeah, <laughs> I know that's like super super adulting, but having an I mean, I grew up without an ice maker, and we had to do the plastic trays of ice, which was awful. Yeah. So <laughs> it's the little luxuries, right? You lose appreciation of over time. Yeah, no, a big, big one for me was the first time I got on an, on an airplane. I was like Ooh, 22 yeah. years old, and I was going to an REU in Notre Dame. And that nice. was like, so it, it coincided with chemistry, which is kind of cool. Yeah. But that's a major, like, career milestone as well as life one. So it's pretty fun to have those events. Yes. But take-home message for the audience, science takes you places. <laughs> sure does. It takes you outside of your bubble of existence that you were born into, which is really good for everyone. All right, anyone just joining us, uh, Ask a Scientist Gaming. Our guest today is uh, Tanya Paris, who's an expert in uh, archaeology, anthropomor uh, anthropological archaeology. Uh, she studies those things like foodways and how animals are, are used in the ancient Americas. Uh, I guess you could describe pre-Columbian times. Is that... Mm -hmm. that's, that's the... And even you know? during the colonial period, right? Okay. The Spanish colonial period here in Florida. Mm-hmm. So if you guys have any questions, throw those in chat. Uh, she is happy to answer them while she plays Galaga. I should really look. I don't know if Galaga has an end. Do you know I know. I have no idea. I'm like, right. mm, I don't know. I'll look up the... Because you might be repeating the same level <laughs> over and yeah. over again at this point. Uh, how many levels? Oh, there is a boss at the end. There's a what at the end? Yeah, oh, the boss. boss. Yeah. Stage 30. So that's King Gallaspark. Oh, goodness. <laughs> All right. Where Let's am see. I at now? I, I don't, don't know. know. If anyone has any ideas, I guess it might pop up on the between screen. I haven't been watching oh, the, right. the break right. screen. Nice. But yeah, stage 30, we're going to see a boss. So that's exciting. We're gonna get... <laughs> Did you ever beat this game back in the day? I don't think so. I was going to say that's like $200 worth of quarters nobody had. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Exactly. There's a cost associated with victory. Yeah, if anyone has questions, feel free to throw those in chat. Otherwise, we will talk about anything we want, which is kind of fun about the stream. We get to dive deep on on whatever we want to do. So so in terms of training a new archaeologist, mm -hmm. like you you get some undergrad that wants to join your lab. I mean, is there like practice sandboxes or is it just kind of like <laughs> dive in and don't screw up? Um, Well, if they're in the lab, it's a lot easier because... Yeah, it's very easy to sit with them and work next to them and check what they're doing and answer all the questions and stuff. Mm -hmm. The field can be a little bit more difficult. I definitely make sure I have um, not only myself, but well-qualified and experienced graduate students with me mm -hmm. to help because you need all hands on deck. Um, my field schools tend to range from like 15 to 25 students, which is huge. That's a really big uh, field crew. And I like to open up a lot of units because field work is very expensive and time intensive. And, you know, the setup and the breakdown takes so much that it's not something you can just go out and do periodically. Mm -hmm. Like if you're going, you're going to do it. So, um, so I always want to do as much dirt moving as possible, mm -hmm. um, but doing it, of course, as scientifically as possible. So in the field, we do a lot of, um, Stage 38. We do a lot of pre-work training. Um, maybe the grad students and I do, you know, show them how to dig properly. Um, the nice thing is most places, not everywhere, but most places have what's called a plow zone. And that's the, it's usually to a depth of like 30 or 40 centimeters where there's been mechanical agricultural plowing because... That hap you know, that just happens, right? There's some kind of disturbance. And so um, the students have to excavate the disturbed soils, even though we know they're disturbed, and but they still have artifacts in them because that is a good way for them to practice so that when they get to the untouched cultural levels, they already know what they're doing, right? And they're not going to mess them up. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's a lot of this really impressing upon the students that you know, there's a right way, many right ways, and a lot of wrong ways. Um, and we're going to learn the, one of the right ways. And 
if you have any questions or any doubts, you just stop and ask. So what's the, the biggest screw up either you experienced or you are aware of in the community? Ooh. I don't, it's a good one. <laughs> That's a good one. I don't. I don't know. I don't know if I want to call anybody out. <laughs> oh, you don't say it by name. Just Whoa. what did they like? No. They just like wandered around and they peed on a skull or something. Like, well, what's the? <laughs> um, no, no, nothing like that. Probably. Well, this is not one, the biggest one, but this is one that I can think of right now. Is going out to survey um, property for like a pipeline type project. Mm -hmm and um, digging all your holes, your shovel tests, getting all your data, and then realizing uh, when you get back to the hotel that night that you were on the wrong property. <laughs> <laughs> You're just digging in some dude's yard. Just some dude's field, you know? I mean, that actually probably hap doesn't happen as much now as it used to because it used to go yes. off a of paper map. Yeah, yeah. And it was terrible. It was, and they would give us, you know, like engineering maps that had all kinds of extraneous information that... Mm -hmm made it very difficult to figure out where you were and, and you know, on the landscape. Yeah. But now with GPS, it's so much. I mean, I, I can use my say, phone and get there. 30 steps from the rock wasn't cutting it, huh? No. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, you have to go to the fence line and then pace off yeah. 30 meters. Okay. Plus or minus. Right. Whoever stride was measuring that. <laughs> That's pretty brutal. I mean, so in terms of technological innovations, obviously GPS is huge on that front. But I mean, there's, there's also... I mean, infrared, there's depth profiling, there's magnetic measure. Like, what's the, what's been the breakthrough? Carbon dating was huge. What, what else, what else is wrong the world? The use of LIDAR. Okay, is that's huge. That's long wave infrared. Is that what it is? I LIDAR. Now. Um, it's light, it's light detecting. Ranging. Do, 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 do. What wavelength? LIDAR stands for light detection and ranging. Yeah. Uh, I want to say it's infrared, but I'll have to look. Um, so that's huge. And any of the remote sensing equipment that we use, like magnetometer, um, ground penetrating radar, all huge um, and helpful because it allows you to, you know, basically get like a CAT scan of mm -hmm. below surface to show you what are the anomalies, right? And that's how, that's how I explain to my students. Like, think about an X-ray or a CAT scan if you have one of a part of your body the doctor then looks at that and says okay you know here's something a blob or a mass or something that's an anomaly that we don't know what it is so we need to go in there and figure out what this is right because we know it's not supposed to be there and if everything was a perfect world so archaeology is the same you know you take these scans of the ground and then you look at different time slices or depth slices you can do it both ways and um and say wow like this you know there's definitely anomalies here because the the sensor is picking up something that shouldn't be there if the ground were undisturbed mm -hmm. and so then you can figure you know and you can look at these really cool maps and try to see patterns and stuff and it's a little bit of an art um and i'm at stage 42. Yeah. They are there. So I, I looked up the answer on this one, actually. And so uh, stage 30, I guess, is the boss. Um, and then there's a there's a point where the scoreboard doesn't turn over anymore. And it's something like 15,999,000. I don't want to get to that. <laughs> and there's, a, there's a kill screen where arcade systems can't process anymore. I don't know if this version has it, but it's at level, what is it, 256 oh, okay. or something like that. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, you can be done at any time if you want to move on to another game. Yeah, I'm probably about ready to go. Yeah, yeah. Else. it's the thumb mashing gets it gets yeah. heavy. So what do you want to do? Donkey Kong? We got Pac Man. We got Space Invaders. Mario. Uh, let's do. Let's do Mario. Super Mario Brothers. All right, and we got Infinite Lives. And the okay. Little dude, have you seen the movie? I have not. My daughter has. It's, it's a pretty nice homage to the to the genre. All right, Shmuel has a follow up. Was there a day of field work that felt like your biggest victory? Does it take time and analysis before you can be certain you found anything significant? I mean, that's a that's interesting. Like, Those often are... you get a false positive. Um, 
Well, you know, when we're, when we're digging things up, they're covered in dirt, so it's very easy to be... Um, to, to be like, oh, you know, this is uh, like a really important ceramic or something, and then once you get it clean, you're like, oh, it's not really. It's like this, you know, it's what we would expect to find. It's not as unexpected as maybe we had originally thought. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, archaeologists tend to be conservative in terms of making snap interpretations because we understand that what we're doing is, you know, it's pretty important and we don't want to to mess it up or to give people the wrong impression. So I don't know if you remember Fire Mario, but you can shoot fireballs. <sighs> yes. <laughs> I do not remember that. But you remember the star. <laughs> that's right, I remember the star. Uh, that's perfect. I mean, so is that a learned experience? I mean, I imagine people first out in the field, they get excited by everything, and then you just get burnt too many times. Well, it's not, yeah, I mean, it, I, I can remember my first field school, I had this TA, she was amazing. She was a master's student at FSU. Her name was Lou Grow, and um, she is unfortunately now deceased, but she was a pretty amazing archeologist in person. And we would always be like, Lou, Lou, what is this? Come look at the screen, what do we have, you know? And she's like, it's a rock. <laughs> like, it's like, oh yeah, this is real special. It's a rock. Just, like, uh, just no emotion, just deliver. It's a rock. Yep. So, um, you know, when you're first starting out, and this is how just my students too, everything goes so slow because you're looking at every little thing in the screen or you're digging really slow because you don't want to mess anything up or miss mm -hmm. anything. Um, and, you know, the more experience you have, the more you know, like, okay, this is, you know, these are rocks that occur naturally here in Tallahassee, so I don't need to stop and collect all of them, right? I don't need to really collect any of them. I'll put it in my notes and then move on with my life kind of thing. Or, you know, oh yeah, this is a, what, the summer we had, what was it? It was, um, was it like an Elmo or something? I don't know, it was like a doll head kind of thing from someone that had lived on the property previously. And that that was pretty fun, because it was like, oh, how old must this be? Mm -hmm. We know it's not that old. I don't even... I mean, so along those lines, like archeologists, they get striations in like the, the, the rock formations, right? And you can date according to that, and there's certain levels. I mean, in recent history, do you get that luxury or is it just kind of all muddled together? Oh no, there's stratigraphy. Okay, there's, there's obvious boundaries between certain time phases yeah because i mean think about it the surfaces that we're looking at are created by humans mm -hmm. over time and so they're doing different things on the landscape um and you may have you know like a trash heap on top of uh previous structures or i've worked at um, a mission site where we excavated a structure that was built in Spanish architectural style, so probably a Spanish family that lived there. Um, but when we excavated down, there were remnants of a circular Appalachian structure <laughs> that had been there previously and then had been dismantled, you know, and a different house had been built on top. And you can really clearly see breaks sometimes, not always. I mean, sometimes you get sites where you just cannot see the stratigraphy. Um, a lot of shell sites are like that. I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, but, yeah, sometimes it's super distinct, especially like with when I was talking about the plow zone. Mm -hmm. That's, you can always see that because it's, it's always kind of gray. Huh. It's just like, meh, you know, it's model. It's just gray and all mixed together. Yeah. Unlike living surfaces tend to be very, you know, very distinct. Mm -hmm. They might be like here with these, um, go back to the Appalachian mission sites, the um, you know, houses had hardened clay floors. That is a very distinct surface mm. compared to regular ground surface or midden surface. Um, Oh, ran what? out of time. Oh, no. Oh, oh that merits a rage. <laughs> oh, that 
that was just cruel. <laughs> oh, should I have warned you that was coming? I didn't even, I forgot about the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's clever. The game adds like music to progress it, but it's it's hard while you're talking and it's, yeah. <laughs> it's distracting. But thankfully you start halfway through the level and have infinite lives, so none of this matters. Right. Only your pride suffers. <laughs> I that. just really wanted to make that jump. Again. <laughs> no worries. Oh, uh, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If anyone has questions for Tanya, she's happy to answer them about uh, Vu archaeology, the influence of animals uh, in early Americas, either as food or as uh, domesticated um, uh, other cultural influences. She is happy to answer any of the questions you may have. Shmuel has a follow up. Um, have you ever been confronted by a conspiracy theorist whose beliefs contradict the math and research and the rest of the community have done? How many conspiracy theorists do you deal with? Um, they're everywhere. I actually have. I had to um, get off Twitter for a while because I had somebody like he was I think he was like. One of the people that was participating in that, like, Nazi digger show or whatever it was that they were doing on Nat Geo. And, um, and, you know, me, myself, and other professional archaeologists had just been tweeting out, like, you know, this is a terrible concept, an idea in National Geographic, what are you doing? Well, well let's back up. Nazi digger? What was the, what was the, the go, To go to Nazi to war sites and dig them up. Okay. And to get Nazi relics. And of course, the internet is full of them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, you know, we had just been speaking out against it on social media. And I, this person was like say, saying that I had said all these things. And I was like, I don't even know who you are. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't even know your name. So I don't know what you're talking about. So I got off for a while because it was just like not worth it. I mean, that, that that's intriguing because there's a certain amount of like, there's history there, but also what are you propagating by, is it the way they framed it was the problem? Yeah, because they were... They were glamorizing, yes. like, okay, mm -hmm. that, that's the issue. And it was to sell views to a particular demographic of yes. people interested, okay. Mm -hmm. And also, I mean, you know, these are battlefield sites. Mm -hmm. People died there. Yeah. They, no matter who it was that died there, I mean, they're... There's a certain protocol. You just don't go digging through looking for belt buckles and mm -hmm. buttons and. And so, the, were these stuff. academics or these were just casual whoever's? These were casual whoever's. So not the dig. <laughs> just no. Amateur. I'm going to search for Nazi stuff. That is intriguing. Yeah. I mean, so that's. So in that case, it's not necessarily conspiracy theorist. It's just disrespectful to the profession. That's true. I mean, there are conspiracy theorists as well all kinds of things um i actually have a my recent book that i co-authored with um aaron dieter wolf who is an archaeologist with the state of tennessee it's called mastodons to mississippians um adventures in in nashville's deep past archaeological adventures in nashville something like that i can never remember the title you know when you write books it's like you have a title that you work with for so long and then it gets changed towards the end by yeah. the publisher you go through seven I, versions i can't ever remember what they are which is crazy um <clears throat> but in there we we you know we address some of the conspiracy theories about things in tennessee like a race of giants um <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's the title. Mastodons to Mississippians, Adventures in Nashville's Deep Past, Truths, Lies, and History of Nashville. Yeah, that's the series. <laughs> that's fun. Through Vanderbilt Press, Vanderbilt University Press. Yeah, it's a it's a really good book. We actually won a, an award for it from the Tennessee Library Association. And on Amazon, you have 12 ratings, and it's at 4.9. So oh, excellent. <laughs> we'll count excellent. that. <laughs> 89% five-star reviews. Do you ever look at these? Mm -mm. No, you don't want to... I just don't ever have time, really. Yeah. I mean, it's not because I don't... Reviews don't bother me. Yeah. It's a, it's a curiosity for me, like, rate my professor, right? Right. Like, it's, it's, it's a guilty pleasure. Oh, no! That was so, so close. close. <laughs> that, was, that was amazing. Yeah. The accidental underrun was pretty fun. Mastodons to Mississippians is a fun title. Yeah. But... Man, okay, so giants in in the the Nashville basin. Like, what else? What are the the other crazy? Um, uh, 
yeah, gi I mean, the big rate, the giant race of humans is one of them. And then there was also something about, like, pygmies, but that, you know, that was not a thing. Um, like, do you, do you know, did you guys pinpoint where that came from? Is that just mm -hmm. made up? It's the like... first, it's the second chapter, I think. Okay. The book, yeah. Because somebody had found a, I think it was a mastodon skeleton. This is, you know. 1800s yeah and dressed it up as a human but it wasn't <laughs> that was it and then took it on tour it was like and charged people pt barnum style pretty much you publicity. know sideshow yeah and uh, so um yeah and it yeah I and mean, that was you know clearly a hoax but sometimes you know things like that get into the kind of collective memory right like mm -hmm. these kind of tall tales or urban legends and they just don't go away and that's that was one of them yeah i had a fun one of those recently uh napoleon being short which is not true so he's documented at five foot two by whatever system they had by the french but he was something like five foot seven five foot eight average size human being but it just propagated because it was either propaganda or just a funny story. So, yeah, it's kind of fun how history does that to us. Mm -hmm. By fun, I mean uh, it sucks for you because you have to dispel that. <laughs> I'm going to focus for a minute. Yep, no worries. Oh, hitbox. That was brutal. Just touching the nose. Oh, man. <laughs> Getting all tense here. You're feeling it. You have been playing for an hour straight. Oh, wow. You probably haven't done for a long time. Uh -uh. And there is an endurance aspect to this, so hopefully your son respects your game prowess of the evening. He you has can... no idea that I can play it like this. <laughs> well, and... you need to bring him back to these games because right. these are brutal. There's no easy setting on any of these. It's just, yeah. <laughs> Codemaster, classic uh, uh, cheat codes. Um, congratulations, GG. We'll get some Bowser drinking alcohol in the American version of Mario Kart. <laughs> uh, that's really fun. Uh, Codemaster said, did you know that if you hold A and press start after you die, respawn at the first level of the world you were last in? Yep. So yeah, if you die on like World 4-3 and you're going back to the main screen, if you hold A and press start, it brings you back to 4-1. And so a lot of people were like 30 years old before they learned that. And we had to burn through many hours playing this game to get back to where we started. So yeah, classic, classic pseudo cheat. I don't know who wrote that into the game, but it's awesome that they did. All right, Shmuel, we'll follow up on the previous discussion. Do you think sources like National Geographic are generally trustworthy? Could they do things better? <laughs> I'll answer the second one, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing about National Geographic. It's actually two different like divisions. There's the Science Research Division, and they mm -hmm. give out lots of grants and funding, and, and, they're, and that's a good thing. Um, but then there is the media side, <laughs> and that is too. that's the entertainment side, right? Yeah. It's, it's entertainment now. It's not necessarily even documentary type stuff like it was when I was a kid. Um, so, I mean, I've I was someone who, in my when I had more time, I would do a lot of like out speaking out about these terrible ideas, you know, like National Geographic had. But again, that is the media side, not the research side. And I actually met with a, was at a meeting where we met with the head of National Geographic and you know, mm -hmm. it was pretty clear that was, he was a scientist. That was not his choice to have things like that. Oh, that's interesting. It's just a necessary evil to pay the bills, presumably. Yeah, I mean, and I think, you know, as the science director, he doesn't really have a say mm -hmm. in what happens on the or whoever the director is now doesn't have a say so much because it's money making. And that's probably also how they get revenue t to pay for the research. The really cool research that happens. Necessary evils. I guess so So on the funding front, where, where's your uh, National Science Foundation? Is that your main? Um, National Science Found, it depends, right? So the cool thing about being an archeologist is that you can apply for funding from places like the National Science Foundation, but also the National Endowment for the Humanities. How do I get out of here? Uh, if you press AAA, you'll swim. Okay. Um, 
So National Endowment for the Humanities or um, all kinds of like the American Council of Learned Societies, mm -hmm. the American In Institute, it's AIA, the American Institute of Archaeology. Mm. Um, they have funding. They're, it's like private funding. But then there are also like state grants you can get. Mm -hmm. Or um, a federal grant that you can get. So like I currently have a grant through the National Park Service. Um, it's part of their American Battlefield Protection Program because the site I'm working at was a battlefield. Hmm. And um, between sovereign nations. So I have a grant for that to them. But I also do work with the National Park Service on um, the CESU program, which is the Cooperative Environmental Studies Unit or something. And basically it's, you know, it's a cooperative agreement um, to train students. Mm. And so uh, you know, they get funding for certain projects and then... Um, we have a this cooperative agreement and there's actually a blanket cooperative agreement for like the whole southeast or whatever mm -hmm. and you know it's like okay here's our project here's the description of the work this is how long it will take this is how much it costs and you know then I I recruit grad students to to work on that project and they get all kinds of practical training and they grow their professional network because they're working at the National Park Service's Southeastern Archaeological Center I mean, so I, this is a different domain of research than me. How much does it cost to do like a week long dig and like take students from here to, you know, middle Florida? Like you have, I mean, there's is, is obviously travel and hotel and whatnot, but is there like permitting processes plus tools plus well, yeah. how does that break down? Mm -hmm. So the good thing is like now I already have my equipment, right? Mm -hmm. But um, let's see, I'm trying to think. This summer, my field work, if if we had to pay for everything out of pocket, which we didn't because we already had equipment or the landowner donated water, his water to us, which is huge because I water screened all the sediments mm. through window mesh. That's really tiny opening. So you get all kinds of artifacts and stuff. You're not missing anything. And um, it... For six weeks with a crew of 20, it easily would have been like $250,000, $300,000. Jeez. And that's just six weeks in the field. So the rule of thumb is for every eight hour day you spend in the field, like one person, mm -hmm. you multiply that by four in the lab. So if I spend one eight hour day in the field, I need to spend four eight hour days in the lab to, to complete the work. That mm -hmm. I did in the field because the field work is just part of it. That's just collecting the samples and in data, and then you have to out you know you have to clean stuff, you have to analyze it, you have to enter the data, write the reports. Um, so it's a lot of work. People have no idea how expensive it is. <laughs> well, I guess that's the other thing is I I just have no idea how this progresses. So like if we had to do a cradle to grave walkthrough, mm -hmm. like you have some idea of a place you want to look. You write a proposal to justify it based on some preliminary information. Um, you ask for money, then go there and dig. Mm -hmm. You collect things, and then what, what kind of measurements do you do when you get that content? You go back to the lab and carbon dating plus what else? There could be carbon do? dating. There's you know classifying the artifacts. Mm -hmm. Here, I'm getting hot. Um, you have to. Classify the artifacts, identify them, analyze them, mm -hmm. you know, collect all, there's all kinds of data you have to collect off of different types of artifacts. And there's a basic kind of level standard that you would do. And anything above and beyond that is specialized. Like even what I do would is often considered specialized. So it's an extra thing that not everybody can pay for mm -hmm. in their projects right away that they may have to, um, you know, save it for later when they get more funding or something. I think I just died. Yeah. <laughs> what, what is that special thing? What's your, what's your... Zooarchaeology. So analyzing oh, animal remains, it just takes a lot of time. I see. So what do you use technique-wise to analyze? Animal remains? Uh-huh. Um, so we have 
at FSU a modern comparative collection of animal skeletons. Mm -hmm. That's a represented a very good representative sample of things we find in the southeast. Mm -hmm. um, a lot, you know, a lot of it's Florida stuff, but we, you know, we can generally do things all across the southeast. So. You know, you have to compare what you have. And that's a visual comparison, typically? Mm -hmm. Okay. You can do, um, there are measurements and stuff you could take as well, but mm -hmm. that's, you have to know what animal you have before you can take the measurements. Because mm -hmm. there's a standard, there's a book that has a standard of, yes, got the flag. <laughs> nice. Cheers. Well, good timing. Reese's Pieces says redeem. Take a drink. Cheers, Reese's Pieces. Thank you for joining us on Wednesday night. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you as usual. And yeah, so Tanya doesn't drink, but I'm drinking in, in honor of Tanya's. Uh, she drinks tea, so I'm drinking a Long Island iced tea. <laughs> so keeping on the theme. Cheers, Reese's Pieces. Thank you as always. I mean, so there's a certain contingent doing, uh, like, if you have genetic information from any of these remains, mm -hmm. like, that's, like, I don't remember what that's called. It's, like, genetic Ancient archaeology. DNA. Yeah, and they can, they can back out timelines from that type of information. Yeah, and it's, it, of course, it's very, spe you have to have the specialized lab, mm -hmm. people that have um, the knowledge to be able to do that and interpret the data. So... <laughs> <laughs> this one's hard. I need to play another game. Mario's pretty ruthless. It is. Yeah, anytime uh, you want to change games, let me know. We can do any any of the list. Uh, we'll or, play something else. Okay. We got Donkey oh. Kong, Pac-Man, uh, Space Invaders. Maybe Space Invaders. I'm going to use the restroom. All right. Sounds good. Yeah. Anyone just joining us, uh, Ask Scientist Gaming, Mediocre Gameplay, Expert Science. The guest today is Tanya Paris. She's taking a break right now, but she'll be back. Uh, she does zoo archaeology. Okay. <laughs> I'll wait for the kid to get out of the bathroom. <laughs> anyway, she's, she studies things like foodways or how animals influence ancient culture, either through what animals people ate or through... Um, how animals influence culture. She's happy to answer any of those questions. And there are some fun keywords in your in your mm. bio too. If I remember correctly. Some that struck me. Uh, where is it? Foodways and ancient da, 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 da. snail farming, garden <laughs> garden hunting, mm -hmm. turkey domestication, bone grease production. Uh, yeah, a lot of diverse areas. Do you accidentally stumble on these areas, or do you, like, target them? How, how does that I think progress? I accidentally stumble on them for them. It's like luck, you know? It's like just luck of the draw here. Yeah. Um, oh, darn it. Um, I mean, let's, let's start with snail farming, because that is an intriguing... <laughs> people farm snails. Sure, I mean, think about uh, escargot. Yeah. That's a farmed snail uh -huh. in France. And... Um, there's evidence that it was being done in the Mediterranean 10, 12, bless you, 15,000 years ago. And so the evidence that we're looking at is in ten Middle Tennessee along the Cumberland River. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing to try to prove. We're still still looking at our data to figure out the best way to present it. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, and when we talk about snail farming, it's not, it's not the kind of industrial farming we have now, mm -hmm. but it's more along the lines of, um, what was I going to say of making the conditions favorable mm -hmm. so that you can increase the bio mass Right, of, of whatever animal it is. Yeah, so you're not making artificial environments. You're just influencing the natural mm -hmm. environment favorable and, for. Right. And, you know, you can even do things like... Ha I I like the idea of having little, like, cages for them. <laughs> These are freshwater snails. Yeah. That you would um, use to help keep, protect them from predators because there are fish that mm -hmm. prey on them. 
And so that could help protect them. And also it's easy to then just catch them. And there's evidence for these cages or it's- There are in the Maghreb, but there's not here in, in Tennessee mm. because it's just, it would be organic materials that don't last. Oh, that makes it hard. All right, Shmuel has a question. Have you ever heard of the Maori legend about giant birds that hunted humans? Is there any truth to that idea? Or the flying megafauna could have hum hunted humans? <laughs> there you go. All right. So we got giant birds that hunted humans. I, I mean, don't know about that. I mean, ostriches definitely exist and do attack humans given the opportunity. Turkeys will too. Yeah. Well, those are vicious some dinosaurs. Yeah, we have chickens. They are dinosaurs. Yeah. Then you have to say clever girl. <laughs> That's right. Get mauled by the <laughs> flying dinosaur. They earned it. <laughs> Maori legend. Giant birds. Oh. Yeah, I don't think the timeline is appropriate for dinosaur-esque giant birds, mm -mm. but... Yeah, ostriches are no joke. They can kill you with a kick. So, yeah. yeah that's why. I mean, so along uh, these lines of ancient legends, like when we do in-person ask a scientist, if we have a psychologist there, inevitably somebody brings up their crazy uncle that has schizophrenia, regardless of the domain of psychology that person studies. And so one of the ways I like to frame this discussion is like the airplane conversation. And somebody's like, oh, what do you do? And you say, archaeologist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then what, what does that conversation look like? Well, how, how does that progress? I always feel like people want to go to the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah. Like that's just the... It's I guess, I guess it makes the news a lot. So people, you know, it's like, oh, I remember something about the Dead Sea Scrolls. What do you know? Well, I don't know very much. Because <laughs> that's really not my area. Um, and you can't, you know, it's like I am try to stay current on my area and adjacent, but something like the Dead Sea Scrolls is very much out of my wheelhouse. I mean, is that still a popular topic? I it mean, is. that's... It is. That's, that's intriguing, because that was discovered how long ago? I, I feel like they've just, and they've, they're always kind of like, oh, we found out this about the Dead Sea Scrolls, or yeah, like, yeah. now we know this, and... And it's just a popular it's just meme, a, and yeah. Yeah, a way to keep interest. Huh going. I if they intentionally trickle out progress and new reports. They and, might. <laughs> that's interesting. I would not have expected that. I, I, I would have expected dinosaurs to be much more common. Again, the Jurassic Park. Sometimes. Yeah. Um, or you get the like, oh yeah, we used to collect arrowheads on my granddaddy's farm. Mm -hmm. Just depends on where you're at, what part of the world you're in. Yeah. No, that's interesting. All right, restroom should be open if yes. you want to take a break. <laughs> All right. So yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play a little bit. I'm gonna die at Bowser though. It's been a long time since I played Mario. Those of you that don't know, I used to speed run this game and I topped out at five minutes and two seconds and some change. I was ranked 176th in the world. No, I'm not even top 500 after three years of progress. All right, I got my taste of some Bowser. <laughs> anyway, all right, if you guys have questions, throw them in chat. We have our standard list of questions. It's been fun talking about archaeology, a domain that I know nothing about, but I'm excited to discuss more. So, yeah, if you guys want to pop questions in chat, we will get them to Tanya. Also, I did not, I've never made a Long Island iced tea before, but I learned today that it contains vodka and gin and triple sec and God, what the hell else is in there? But it's like, it's 40% ethanol, which is why it gets its reputation. But I did not know that prior to making it today. So yeah, I'm drinking a whole bunch of uh, Long Island iced tea. So this could be an interesting night. But we are celebrating the end of the semester. Finals week was last week. Grades were submitted. Grades are posted as of today. So Ooh. any of the students at FSU at least, congratulations on completing another semester. <laughs> 
because yeah especially the grad students who are done taking classes for the rest of their lives that's our first year chemistry students are officially done with classes which is very exciting yeah no it's it's hard with the lights <laughs> yeah. and the computer and i have a extra air conditioner running in back but it doesn't it doesn't do it justice unfortunately check what the temperature is out outside all right so keep doing mario or change it up change it up a little bit all right we could do donkey kong pac-man space i guess we said space invaders yeah let's right? go for space invaders all right so we're gonna transition to space invaders which brings us to the super nintendo there we go so this is the 1997 re-release of space invaders they basically ported it into the super nintendo entertainment system um yeah they didn't do much to change the game the gameplay is the same uh, but it, now it's on 16-bit systems, so <laughs> quite glamorous. <laughs> <laughs> so if you press start, I think right. it'll go to main menu, maybe. And that start button is a little bit there we go. jank. So original game mode. Right. All right, now hit the bumper and then press start. There we go. And we should have infinite life. Mule, have a great night, y'all. It's always great to hear some academic discussions. Absolutely. Thank you for stopping by. Thank yeah, you for thank all the you, questions. Mule. It was, was awesome. Nice. Um, yeah, hopefully we'll see you at some point in, in, in person, Ask a Scientist, and or in two weeks when we have our next guest on Ask a Scientist Gaming every other Wednesday night. Uh, I haven't scheduled the summer yet, but I think it, it stays on the every other Wednesday night for until August. So I will find people that are willing to reply to my email when I say, hey, do you want to drink and play video games while talking science? Tanya said yes. <laughs> Which is kind of crazy. I mean, had you heard about this before doing yeah. it? No. So what was your response to that email? I was like, is this guy for real? Who is this person? So I had to look you up, make sure you were legit. <laughs> yeah, not a psychopath. <laughs> and then um and then I looked at I looked at the you know previous people. Yeah. And I saw people that I knew, so Yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay. I promise I'm not a psychopath. Right, it's legit. No, I, I definitely include like you know greetings from the chemistry department, right. blah blah blah, because I have to like it is it is a weird request. It's a weird request. <laughs> but it works out. It's fun. Yeah, and we get a broad cross section of people, which is really fun. So so you're my first anthropologist actually on cool. stream. So well, yeah. we're hiring a bunch more, so you'll have... Yeah, I saw the job posting. It's like yes. two opening... What were the dom domains? We had two cultural anthropologists and one biocultural, and we want people want people that had um, health research interests. Mm. And so we have, you know, medical anthropologists that will mm. be coming on board. Pretty exciting. And so is that piggybacking on FSU's health initiative mm -hmm. thing? Okay, so you're leaning that way. That's fun. Yeah. Well, I mean, yes, because we've we always have had um, a good relationship with the interdisciplinary medical sciences mm -hmm. program. I just keep getting killed like one after the other. What's happening? Oh no! My so stuff? so I, we have infinite lives, but one of them reached the bottom. So that means we have to restart, okay. unfortunately. Um. So we have. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, the curse of infinite lives, the purgatory <clears throat> of space invaders. Um, so we we've always had a good relationship with the interdisciplinary medical sciences program. Um, they encourage their students to take anthropology classes because it helps them with their interactions with patients oh, to be more culturally aware. Uh -huh. um, and then also we offer things like human osteology, and that's a very different class than physiology and anatomy because um, it's just the bones, just the skeletal system. So that's intriguing. So you do that from a, like, what do we learn from the bones perspective? Is mm -hmm. that the, oh, mm -hmm. okay. So About. you look at like force lines and like how those... <laughs> That is intriguing. And they encourage that, but it's not required necessarily. It's an optional course for that. Right, it's elective. Okay, what am I supposed so to do? press start. There we go. Hmm. 
Well, that's interesting. So what are the, I guess, in, in chemistry, we have inorganic, organic, physical, analytical, so on and so forth. What are your partitioning lines? So we have four subfields, mm -hmm. uh, cultural anthropology, which is the one that most people think of when they think of anthropology. And that, that <clears throat> would encompass studying certain living, living societies, looking at extant cultures. Uh -huh. Um, you know, Margaret Mead was a cultural anthropologist. Mm. Zora Neale Hurston, cultural anth well, she's a cultural anthropologist and a folklorist. Um, so, <clears throat> cultural anthropology, then of course archaeology, mm -hmm. um, biological anthropology it used to be called physical, but I would say that people, uh, they've everything has been updated to biological because it's more than just physical remains it's also you know chemical we do stable isotope analysis ancient dna um so biological that's the umbrella of living things and studying and it could be also non-living humans um so that would also include things like paleoanthropology i see um and you know the study of human evolution mm -hmm. in the earliest ancestors so <clears throat> there's that and then there is linguistics Hmm. Anthropological linguistics, um, which is really cool. I loved my linguistics classes when I took them in college. They're some of the hardest anthropology classes I ever took. Um, there's so much to know about language. It's just fascinating. So those are the four divisions. Hmm. And when anthropology started, you could be a four-field anthropologist because you could master all of that knowledge. Yeah, the Renaissance when right. and content now, was low. Now you can't. Now it's just very way too difficult. But it's pretty cool because people are combining different subfields in different ways, which I think is pretty interesting. Like I work with my friend who's the cultural anthropologist and we're doing ethnozoarchaeology mm -hmm. to better understand, you know, how the ancestors of living people um, like the Cherokee, how their ancestors, you know, incorporated animals into their worldview and what their, just how they, not only what they ate, of course, but also other things like the hunting amulets and such. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, we should do another prediction because it has been a while. I keep forgetting to do that. So which one do you want to do? What are you excited to talk about? Um... I don't know. Do you, you choose? You can talk about <laughs> Dealer's choice. All right. I'm I'm curious about this one because okay. that that is a that is an interesting terminology. All right. Anyone not following the stream should click the follow button right now. One, it helps with our visibility and the number of viewers we have, uh, but also it helps for um, uh, you getting standard internet units, which you can use on predictions. Predictions are basically questions we ask on stream. In our case, we ask science questions that our guest has come up with, uh, things that might be interesting, things that you may or may not know. Um, so we're going to throw a question up there right now. Um, and if you click the predict button, you'll see the question and you can bet as many as standard internet units as you want. Uh, but the question here is what did tribes make out of, what is it? Lex? Ilex. Ilex. Ilex vomitoria. So what is Ilex vomitoria without giving away the answer? Me? Yep. It's a plant. Is that good enough? So it is a plant. Did they make black drink or beer? And black drink is the formal name, uh, accepted name for describing a particular drink. Mm -hmm. Or did they make uh, beer out of this particular plant? Um, Ilex vomitoria. I'm Which, of sure. course, is the you know imperial Linnaean taxonomic name for it. Uh, yeah, I was going to say this is Latin roots <laughs> referring to <laughs> vomitoria. I'm sure there's a fun backstory behind that. But the question is, what did they make out of it? Did they make a uh, black drink or did they make beer out of it? Which is an important question because throughout time, people have made a whole lot of things into beer. But also, wow. what else can you do with it? So it's a curious question. Oh, duh. Sorry. <laughs> Did move. <laughs> She's getting wrecked. This is terrible. Space Invaders is a ruthless it game. It is. It's tough, And it man. just gets hot, harder. Fun factoid for anyone that not familiar with Space Invaders, as you kill the guys, they move faster. 
and it's the music gets faster. Yep. And so the the, the it's very stressful. The the fun part about that is the only reason they start moving faster is the processing power of the original game wasn't good enough to handle when less characters were on the screen. So it was actually an accident. One of the key mechanisms that made it so much fun was an accident of the processing power of the original gameplay. And not only that, learned this from one of our other guests, uh, Julian Grasso, who studies music theory as related to gaming. Mm -hmm. This was the first game that had basically a soundtrack external to the gameplay. Oh, wow. Because, like, it's uh, one of the arguments is, oh, the sounds don't travel in space, but also this had a cadence, and that cadence and rhythm changes as you progress through mm -hmm. the game. So, yeah, a lot of milestones associated with Space Invaders. All right. Mm. So we've closed everyone bet black drink. So the answer is black drink. Black drink. Good good predictions. So they did not turn it into beer despite yeah. throughout history most things have been turned into beer one way or another. But in this case Ilex vomitoria. Yes. So what it, it's just a it's a plant? Yes. It's the Yapon holly mm. plant and it is native to the Gulf Coastal Plain. So where we're, where we live, <laughs> um, you have to restart the game because oh I'm no oh sorry caught in that loop yeah um, the infinite life death loop <laughs> purgatory <laughs> hell of space maybe. invaders I apologize which which level of hell is that <laughs> um, we're gonna go with the one at least <laughs> so um, yeah so Ilex vomitoria is the Yapon holly which is native to the Gulf Coastal Southeast. Um, it was native here to Tallahassee, and they made the black drink, which is a form of tea, out of it. And um, the reason it got the name Vomitoria for its species name is because Native Americans used it in ritual ceremonies, and oftentimes they used it in combination with sweating and sweat lodges and fasting before important events. Huh. And, um, you know, you, you, all of us know that if you have an empty stomach for days, you're sweating in a very hot council house or sweat lodge, and you drink copious amounts of caffeinated beverage that's really strong, you probably gonna throw up. <laughs> <laughs> so that is like, it is an accurate descriptor. It's a, it's a caffeinated beverage. It's not as heavily caffeinated as coffee or even maybe not even matcha, but it's um, it is a it has a very distinct chemical substance in it mm -hmm. that we can see um, chemically and like that gets absorbed into ceramics mm. that are not glazed on the inside. Um, and so oops. so that's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, so so, so that's a, that's a curious thing because you're like recreating something that historically existed. Uh, what's the degree in confidence and how good we are in recreating that? So we have um, written documentation by like recipes. Yeah, basically kind wow. of by um, Spanish and um, English explorers, maybe mm -hmm. some French mm -hmm. and about what they witnessed. And so we things have been recreated off of that. Um, so I have with me this is the best one. This is um, called Delta Rising, Yapon Holly Tea, and it's made by a company called Ilex Organics out of Clarksdale, Mississippi. And um, they they combine it with other things like lemongrass and spearmint and peppermint, and it actually tastes pretty good. And it just comes in little tea bags. And I like it because it does have caffeine in it, but it doesn't. it's not like coffee, so they have it huh. just as a little tea bag. It smells stronger than chamomile um now i also have a friend who collects um maybe we should play something different so <laughs> no worries um, um donkey kong or donkey kong pac-man all right um so she collects it and roasts it and makes tea out of it i actually have a have a container of roasted holly leaves at my house that she gave me um and you just make a tea out of it, right? You just steep it mm -hmm. like you would. And so you can have it just plain like that. It can be very bitter when it's just plain. Um, I really like this Delta Rising one. I think it's very flavorful. It tastes really nice. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty cool. 
Um, you know, I, oh, hello. I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> No, I can't stop hammering. Yeah, no, you're stuck with the hammer until it runs out. Totally worth it, though. Oh, no. <laughs> so Donkey Kong is one of the original, again, very popular arcade games. If anyone, oh, have, you, have you seen the documentary um, Donkey Kong Fistful of Quarters? No, that sounds fun. It is on pursuing the world record in Donkey Kong, and it came out at oh, least gosh. 10 years ago. It's probably 15 years ago or so. It's, it is one of my favorite documentaries of all time. Okay. Not necessarily the content, but the storytelling is just spectacular. The bad guys are bad, the good guys are good, and it just writes itself. It is absolutely amazing, but it's literally people just pursuing the world record in Donkey Kong. That is so cool. <laughs> Yeah. I, I mean, if the I, internet has taught me anything, it's to appreciate anyone that's passionate about literally any topic, whether it be archaeology or Donkey Kong, yeah. like just be the best at what you do, like learn as much as you can, because there are people that care about it. There are things to be learned. So, yeah, absolutely. Is there sound? I don't think I'm playing this game. Are you not? Press start. Press start. <laughs> oh man oh Drinking. your your son has fodder for the next like year or so I'm after he's that still, he's still even on <laughs> are did you here did you go to bed yet g-man <laughs> oh man <laughs> no worries i did not know the fire could climb the broken ladder me neither and Look i just that. On top we of just it. learned a factoid that's pretty fun <laughs> <laughs> no worries. You didn't have to tell people you weren't drinking. <laughs> <laughs> you already told them. Yeah, no, it's true. Have you ever seen, and this is a way old school, Romancing the Stone? Yes. Movie? Yeah, yeah, with uh, Doug, Michael Douglas. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and there's the scene where their car is, they have this little tiny car, and it's in the river, and she's trying to, like, drive it, and he's like, what are you doing? Like, she's steering it, and he's like, we're, we're in the river, like, we're going downstream. That's just, that was my <laughs> That's a beautiful analogy. I perfectly captured that. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that's, that's really fun. All right, let's let's go back to some of our canned questions that we have. Um, one of the, one of the ones I like to ask is like, if you had a a microphone to speak to the entire world about your discipline, either like dispelling something or dropping knowledge on someone, like if you could make everyone in the world understand one aspect of your discipline, what would it be? That's a high pressure question. That is a high <laughs> pressure question. But but it's fun in terms of like if you distill down like your entire expertise into one sound bite, what what is the Um Okay. There's lots of things I could say and probably should say, but the one that's coming to mind now, because this is something that I, I do say, is that um, you know, Archaeology, right, is the study of history, mm -hmm. um, just in a different way than historians study history. But one thing to remember is that it's everywhere. Right? You don't have to learn about civilizations that lived thousands of years ago by traveling overseas. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you don't have to go to Egypt. There's lots of really interesting history in your backyard. Now, I'm not asking, telling people they should go do that, please don't. <laughs> but they should learn about the history of where they live. Yeah. Um, and so many people do not, like, do not even know about who the people were that lived on the lands where they live now. You know, mm -hmm. 100 years ago, 500 years ago. Um, because there's really interesting stories out there. <laughs> Related side note, much less dramatic than the history you're talking about. So we, we have this house. This house you're in right now was built in 1958. My wife and I have lived here for almost 10 years now. And so we've done renovations and whatnot and made changes to the yard. Uh, about a month ago, when the yard working people were like, you know, laying sod and stuff like that, they found a giant hole in the front yard. <laughs> and it goes down in and there's like this compartment in our yard. There's about a five point five foot by eight foot space hole in our yard. And they're like, is this a bomb shelter? Is it, you know, whatever? Turns out it is a cistern. 
Oh. So we had just a water cistern that was like covered over with like wood pallets and we didn't know about it for eight years. Oh my gosh, that's <laughs> so, scary. So we literally have an open front hole and we had to show the daughters because like, don't get trapped in the hole right. kind of thing because we have to fill it in. So, oh my gosh. <laughs> fun like 50 year history of our household <laughs> wow but that's one of those like you're talking you know 1950s that's cuban missile crisis mm -hmm. like was this a bomb shelter like we got to our own little archaeological experience of our own which is kind of fun that's pretty cool but mm. dangerous at the same time yeah exactly so we have to deal with that and figure out how to you know there's professionals that fill in holes we got to figure out how to do that with the right mm -hmm. like tampering and whatnot um, but, but following up on that question, so like, I know in, in archaeology, in terms of like the evolutionary biology, there was this like missing link between mammals and whales, right? Mm -hmm. And then they found that missing link and they knew exactly where to look. Now, in your discipline, does that happen where somebody just like figures out either the striation or the location and then it becomes a hot topic? Or how, how does that? That's a great question. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, why did I die? I don't understand. That's the second time I it's, died if there. If you fall from a certain height, you die in this game. No, so you can't drop too far. I didn't realize I was falling. Mm. Um, there, you know, okay. So just like in most things, there there are trends, right? Mm -hmm. So there are trends in archaeology. Mm -hmm. um, and... You know, it's like no one's studying a certain topic and then all of a sudden it feels like everyone's studying that topic because you know, we go to conferences and we talk and stuff. Archaeology is, there are a lot of archaeologists, but it's also a very small community yeah. and everybody knows everybody and um, which is kind of fun. And... Um... So let's see, I'm trying to think what would be a hot topic right now. I mean, this this is just the community collectively saying, hey, here's something new and interesting. I mean, there's no objective gauge on what's yeah. interesting. It just it infiltrates your culture. Um, you know, it depends on where you're working. Oh. I'll keep doing that. <laughs> that <was a> hard <laughs> jump. <laughs> I'm gonna make this game it. is brutal. Anyone that hasn't played Donkey Kong or Mario or any of these old school games, I strongly encourage you to do so because this will teach you a lesson about old school gaming. It's fun. <laughs> it's fun, the word. <laughs> nice. It's fun, the word. <laughs> Darn it! Um. Okay, I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> it was about hot topics in archaeology. Oh, like right. the, 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 the culture changes depending on what's what's sexy, what what is Right, and also it depends like so archaeology has gone through these different developmental phases of um, you know, like description, all everything just being described because that was very early archaeology, so people would just describe what they were seeing and not really mm -hmm. looking for patterns in the data or anything, or collecting standardized data. Um, and um, and then it went to something called processual archaeology where it became very scientific and you know there was a a real big push to standardize methodologies create mm -hmm. new methodologies a lot of new types of sub disciplines within archaeology came about like zooarchaeology came about in, during processualism mm -hmm. um and then there was a backlash to that which uh, you know processualism was a backlash to like just people describing things mm -hmm. The culture history time uh, period in archaeology. And then there's post processualism, which was like, hey, we need to remember that there are people that we're studying, not just statistics or. Mm -hmm. um, because at the time, you know, in the 60s and 70s, the. Whoa. Nice. <laughs> oh, that was close. Um, <laughs> Stressful. <laughs> Very stressful. You, you didn't think you'd be this stressed. <laughs> no, I know. Um, it's a good stress, though, right? Mm -hmm. It's fun. Um, the computer programming and systems theory was really popular at that time. Mm -hmm. And so 
we saw a lot of that in in archaeology. It's I always tell my students, I'm like, go look at journal articles from the 70s. Every single one of them will have a figure that is a um, some kind of like flow chart or hmm. you know feedback loops of the negative and positive feedback loops to certain kinds of behaviors and stuff. And they're like, oh, you're right. It's like every every single one, <laughs> every single one has that. Yeah. Um, and then so that became very like, like too sterile. And the pushback was like, hey, we're anthropologists. Where are the humans? It's yeah. not just about these models. And so um, post processualism has really, really pushed things like ethno archaeology, um, where you're looking at modern groups for analogies that you can use to interpret what you're seeing archaeologically or looking at um, you know, gender and archaeology, femi feminist archaeology, um, or looking more at things like religion or just the cultural aspect and trying to find the people that's super important. So I mean, that's intriguing. So you've talked to, you talked about like trends in like methodology as well as like topical areas. But does like a time period become sexy or a particular, you know, culture become sexy? Is sure. That... Um, yeah, those like the early, you know, peopling of the Americas is mm -hmm. a very hot topic. People, right now, that's the... That's... It, I think it's almost always a hot topic, but it it gets a lot of attention when there are, you know, new discoveries being made. Um, and so I think we have some of that going on right now because even one of my colleagues, Dr. Jesse Halligan, mm -hmm. ha makes discoveries in the Osceola River and um, it, you know publishes on them and gets a lot of media um, for it. And so she, yeah. <laughs> so that you know that's like whenever there are new discoveries where someone has found the oldest mm -hmm. whatever X, right? The oldest X. Um, then it becomes a hot topic again. So other things that are probably I'm trying to think really popular right now. Well, for a while, the topic of feasting was a really big thing. Feasting. Well, what does that encompass? Communal eating activity, huh. eating events, and because it's people look to feasting as you know. Okay, well, when you have a feast, what what do we know about human behavior? Mm -hmm when a feast is involved. Well, we know that it takes a lot of resources, oh, that's um, true. both actual like food things, but also the cooking, the cookware, the firewood maybe. Yeah. Um, you know, other people are probably helping with it. So you have now ties of obligation with different people. They're most likely kin. Um, and then why are we having, you know, why is there a feast? What is it celebrating? What is the purpose of it? I mean, that's intriguing. So you're framing this, uh, there's, there's a context of like, there's cost associated with these ceremonies and someone has valued this enough to, I don't know how to, like, kill him. I don't know how to get past him. I think you have to break every one of those, the yellow oh. bridges. And I think you can do it. So if you walk over every one of those, oh. I think that's how you get. And then you have to go up to the top if I remember correctly. But that's intriguing. Like a, a lot of this, I mean, I'm, I'm a chemist, right? So I, I think in terms of like molecular reactions and whatnot, and we talk about things like kinetics and thermodynamics and thermodynamics, there's an energetic cost. Mm -hmm. And so this, this exists in archeology span and anthropology that like, there is a cost of every ceremonial thing you did, but it was enough of a benefit to society that it was worthwhile. Maybe. Which is, it's, it's, in, 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 I, yeah, maybe it's a how, weird lens to look at it. How do you define the benefit, right? So, yeah. the, one of the things that we look at with, for instance, feasting is mm -hmm. it's a way for people to gain social capital. Yeah. Um, or status or to reinforce their status. Mm hmm. Um, Oh my goodness, a little, what is that, a little? Fireball, <laughs> you know, a little fireball. <laughs> exactly. Everything's fine. Yeah. No, we have, we have nothing to be concerned about. <laughs> That's we found one level. Yeah, no, this game is mm. unforgiving from the start to finish. Um, So, yeah, like with feasting, you know, it's like, okay, well, is it competitive? Are people trying to out-compete each other by having the biggest party? Um, 
or you know showing like oh, i have all this wealth because i can mm -hmm. feed all of these people or now it's like i've invited all these people to my to my feast ceremony and i've provided all this food so now they owe me yeah it's an obligation now um or are we doing a potluck style is there a potluck style feast as well yeah no, that's i mean that's such a hard problem like i have the luxury in chemistry i get to like manipulate my things at will i don't have human behavior let alone human oh, behavior human ten thousand years ago behavior like, is a whack hu humans are hard <laughs> they are they're really hard <laughs> i mean that's that's pretty brutal I mean, so go, going back to the question on trends, and you said there was the, the, this trend going towards this more objective and dehumanizing of the anthropology. There, there was, yeah. And so, so like, in, I mean, I guess uh, thinking about this from the, the framework, so I work a lot in solar cell technology, and one of the major breakthroughs in solar cell research, believe it or not, was defining the sun. And that seems like a stupid thing, but like the sun is not the same in Florida as it is in Siberia, mm -hmm. right? And so if you want to compare across different researchers across the globe, you need a standard metric to can do that comparison. And so is, is there like standardized, I mean, there's standardized reporting, is there standardized references? How do you guys talk across different domains, different timescales, different continents to make sure you're on the same dialogue? Right, that's a great question. So, I mean, when you, think about it like i said i was talking before about the term prehistory mm -hmm. and that it means something different here in the americas than it does in europe mm -hmm. um so that's something that we have to realize that we mean different things mm -hmm. and we need to define them and oftentimes having absolute dates is really the best way to do it mm -hmm. so to talk about something being you know ten thousand years before present or Nice. So whatever. GG's. Earned it. Um, Earned it. That That's one way of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, archaeologists can be... They can be what we call splitters in that, um, you know, they want to categorize all kinds of things because they think this is, you know, it's a unique type of ceramic or... Um, but maybe it's not really that unique. I knew that was coming. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this. Let me, let me stop and reframe that. Yeah. So, um, it can be difficult sometimes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, say, you know, I've done a little bit of work in Scotland and I would love to do more. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I have to, it's the onus is on me to go out and f find out what their terminology is, how they're using different terms. Um, mm -hmm or you know what they call their time periods what kind of artifacts are we looking at even things like when we say artifacts they will call them small finds <laughs> it's just that simple <laughs> or oh, that is amazing yeah we call things like we have an excavation trench yeah um or an excavation unit well in france it's called a sondage yeah and it's like okay like it's different you know it's like that's what they're gonna call it it's it's a sondage so i need to know the terminology and it's on the person you know it's on me to do that i don't they don't need to translate it for me i need to figure it out i mean so is there uh shoot again this is like a chemistry centric view but is there there a push to do more stuff like it seems like carbon dating is kind of a like a universal mm -hmm. i mean it's not absolute but at least gives you something quantifiable to discuss across these domains is there a push to standardize that nomenclature and whatnot or is it just it's still the wild west of I think, archaeology and, i think it's too hard to to standardize nomenclature because we're looking at so many different human societies yeah. through different time periods that there, there's just no way to do that. Um, and so you're not even like reading and writing the same journals, right? It's just sometimes, like... Sometimes. It just depends. Yeah. Um, it. it just depends on what the topic is mm -hmm. and how applicable the topic is to... Um, the readership of that journal and there are lots of archaeology journals some yeah. are very regionally you know heavily regionally focused um and then there are others like uh, journal of archaeological science which is more mm -hmm. very international um the, there's a journal called antiquity that's international but then we have like american antiquity 
it's really for North America. Mm -hmm. Although sometimes you might see some stuff that's from south of the border or north of the border. Um, but then we also have a journal called Latin American Antiquity that is for things that are south of the border. I mean, so is, is standardization across those, uh, is, is that an eventual outcome or is it, it just like, it's too hard to do? It's too hard to do. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, even like I've written perspective articles saying we need to standardize how we describe quantum yield of photon up conversion, which is such a subtle, like nuanced field, but it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to get people that even talk the same language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, nice trying to even get like zooarchaeologists to standardize the t the data that they collect yeah i mean it's very difficult because we all collect pretty much the same kinds of data mm -hmm. but sometimes you know like you don't have the time or the right kind of sample to be able to collect things that are more um specific so you can only standardize so much mm -hmm. people don't really like there's I mean, so this is another one we touch on with uh, major communities is that like machine learning and AI is infiltrating everything, right? Mm -hmm. But the, the things to those, the key to success of those working in any way is like having universal data sets that they can process. Right. And like, has that started to infiltrate your world or is that still infancy? Um, well, okay. So that's interesting question. I actually have just been working on some stuff. Um, you know, big data in archaeology is not necessarily the same as big data maybe in sociology, yeah. but it is big for us. And so the, I'm saying the last... Uh, <laughs> Fireball I screwed you there. <laughs> yeah, like, what do you do? Know where to go. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> um, and the, um, I'm trying to think, probably the last 20 years, mm -hmm. there, there has been a push to um, come up with ways to collectively integrate data sets mm -hmm. that maybe were not collected by the same, definitely were not collected by the same people or, or from the same sites mm -hmm. um, so that we can, you know, it's like instead of having just site focused data sets, yeah. individual site, now we can look more broadly and be able to use other people's data because really it's like why are we doing all this work and collecting these these different data sets if we're no one else is ever going to use them yeah. because we make it so specific to our own research that i don't know what just happened there as, as the the like there's like if you're over one centimeter on the fall it's death Apparently. if you're less than that you're okay um i mean no. so, so this comes back to that standardization question right like right. how do you how do you report the same data set across disparate areas um so that is something that people are trying to do and they're solving the problem in different ways um, and the, one of the ways that, that I've w done it or been working with a, a group we're called the Eastern Faunal Working Group um, is to, is to, okay, there's a, there is a um, online digital repository called the Digital Archaeological Record or TDAR for short. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's, um, was started by a bunch of archaeologists with funding from like NSF and Mellon and NEH and other organizations. Mm -hmm. And it's my favorite digital repository. There are lots of others or several others, but it's my favorite because I can upload my data set mm -hmm. collected the way I collected it. You can upload your data set the way you collected it. And then we can integrate them within the um repository without having to like i don't have to pull down your data set and clean it up to fit my standards so there's like a standard conversion to like it, yeah they it's called mapping wow. things to ontologies that so interesting you come up with these ontologies that are standardized uh -huh. and you map all the data sets to them i keep doing that <laughs> i need to move i think you have to commit to that i yeah, do yeah. i just need to get up there so so if you saw donkey kong king of quarters one of my favorite scenes is he plays this on like the arcade and he takes like a, a whiteboard marker and draws out the path and apparently there's two paths of this bouncing thing one of them kills you the other one doesn't and that's how he decides so okay I, I, i'll send you a link after yeah this, please do you, you need to watch, watch it it is so entertaining <laughs> i apologize 
But yeah. So it sounds like standardization is it's it's people are thinking about it. Yes. It's, just, it's and, a hard problem. And people are trying to solve this problem um, in different ways. Mm -hmm. Nice. GG's. <laughs> I did it. Is anybody left with us? Oh, absolutely. We have, <laughs> we have at least eight viewers right now. Yay! If anyone has questions, so, so this is the hard part. Like, I just dive into it. Like, yeah. I'm genuinely just interested in how things work, and I learn a lot through the process. But if anyone has questions, we're about two hours into Ask a Scientist Gaming. Our guest is Dr. Ta uh, Tanya Paris. Uh, she has she has expertise in archaeology, in particular related to, uh, well, either animal or, or human archaeology, especially in the ancient Americas. Um, she's interested in how animals influence our culture, uh, our ancient culture, in terms of both like food as well as uh, how they in integrate into in terms of domestic of pets and whatnot so if you guys have any questions throw them in chat i'm gonna throw a question as i run to the bathroom <laughs> so we'll give you some some fodder to talk to the audience while i'm gone um uh, let's go with what is one of your biggest pet peeves in the field like when you review articles or when you see this reported publicly like what is what is the thing that bothers you about your your current state of you know zoo archaeology and how that's described Mm, that's a great question. I was one level. Why am I dying? This game has crazy fall damage. Yes, it's crazy. All right. <laughs> so I missed it. What's the what's the short answer on? On your pet peeves. In the I didn't field. say anything. You I was, didn't. No, I was You're waiting focusing. for you. Oh, you could have gone. I okay. figured I would do this. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> um, so one of my biggest pet peeves. I have lots of pet peeves. Um, mm. but I think probably my biggest pet peeve is when there are archaeologists that do not understand the value of zooarchaeology or paleoethnobotany, which is the plant counterpart to what I do. Um, and that just see it as like, oh, well, you know, if, if we have the money or, um, yeah, but I don't know what the path is. <laughs> Reese's Pieces offering advice. <laughs> um, I'm going to try this one. I'm just going to go back and forth. Maybe I can zigzag it. Yeah. So. Terministic, right? Like there's certain. I'll try it. I haven't tried this memorize. one. Memorize. Um, so, you know, people just being like, oh, like they're only looking at ceramics or they think food is not, you know, we don't need to know about food. It's not important. Mm -hmm. And I maintain that, well, everybody has to eat. Food is very important. You can't live without eating. Mm -hmm. And ooh, go, 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 go. oh, pump faked. <laughs> Playing chicken with that fireball. Yeah, that's it. Got this. <laughs> Reese's pieces applied some pressure. In it, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. So when people think that you know, food is oh, it's just 
animal remains, you know, it's just trash. It's like, no, food... Food is one of those things that it is a biological necessity, and mm -hmm. we ascribe so many different levels of meaning, layers of meaning to food. It's it is fascinating. Yeah, it's so fascinating. So that's that's one thing. I mean, it's it's biological, it's cultural, it's social, it's uh, but it's not as sexy as an amulet, right? Like or a necklace or, or a spear point. Yeah, that's in, that's intriguing. And is that popular culture, or is that just no, within, the community? within the community? Wow. So somebody wants the new weapon more than they want the uh, oh, the dining strategy. Maybe, and... yeah. I mean, even even probably, like, you know, for non-archaeologists, mm -hmm. you have to really frame it in a, in a way that they can see... Um, they can understand why it's so exciting right it's not just oh food like i i think about food all the time to the point where it's probably like detriment to my <laughs> mental health um <laughs> definitely my metabolism so um you know i'm always thinking about food and what it means and i had a colleague once say to me that and he would say this to his students too that you know, anthropology ruins you for life because you can't ever just look at things. Like, yeah. you can't ever be, you always have, you to, have like, to contextualize yeah, it. And, yeah, you know, and, um, and so, yeah, f and food is hard to see, right? It's just animal remains, yeah, yeah, yeah. With bones, and it's not nearly as exciting as, like, the big shine, you know, big lithic stone tool that somebody napped into a spear point to kill big animals with. Mm hmm. So it's like the whole fallacy of man the hunter. Yeah. That's a that's one that really gets my goat. I mean, so, so, so following up on that, like your lens of existence has changed significantly. Do you ever think about like 10,000 years from now when they view our culture, what are they going to see about my Thanksgiving dinner? Like, does it, <laughs> do, do, do you reflect on how we will be viewed or what information will like it's going to be a very different because we have digital age and you'll see instagram posts about mm -hmm. it like is it's, it's if we know how to read that technology at exactly. that time yeah, oh, yeah. Close. <laughs> oh. Ah. but even then does, does does your perspective go forward speculating or is it is it hard i mean it, obviously it's hard to do that because who it knows is. what ai is going to care about 10,000 years from now. <laughs> and um, I, so when I teach my undergrads in intro to archaeology, I have, darn it. Oh, I, I guess took guess. that risk. <laughs> um, I, I have a garbology project that we do. And they have to interpret modern trash. <laughs> garbology is that is that an accepted terminology it in is. the community? You can be a garbologist. Really, it's a garbologist. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, that is amazing! I'm so jealous of your guys' terminology. <laughs> but anyway, the assignment is to look at just their garbage, or no? They have to. So I, it varies depending on the year and the semester and what university I'm at because. Mm. Um, it just, you know, just depends. So. <laughs> it's awesome. I just looked up an article on garbology and the, the subtitle is Our Dirty Love Affair with Trash. Ooh, that by? Uh, that is by... Sure, it's Amazon book. Look uh, up... Edward Humes. I don't... That name is actually kind of familiar, but look up the garbology project in Arizona. Okay. That's the original one, and that is... It's really cool. I have a video that the um, the main archaeologist... It's the Tucson Garbage Project? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Tucson Garbage it's Project. It's so interesting. It's underselling the impact, that's for sure. <laughs> it's so interesting because they would... Um, they did all different kinds of things. They looked at people's trash from their house and they would interview them and ask them, you know, like what kinds of things they ate and how much alcohol they drank. Oh no, you found my YouTube channel. Oh, you <laughs> my shared YouTube, your YouTube channel. YouTube. So, oh, I did, so, right. so Tanya has a bunch of YouTube, but these are like interviews with other yeah, people in yeah, your yeah. videos as well. And so it sounds like you have a, a discussion on there about this topic, but here's her playlist. So Tucson Garbage Project, as well as any discussion. Sorry to interrupt. I wanted to share that with the uh, viewership. Um, so people, when they interviewed them, 
would say, oh, no, I never drink or I eat very healthy, but my neighbor, you know, they drink a lot, blah, blah, blah. And then they they would look at the people's garbage and <laughs> find a very We're different story. Liars. <laughs> very different Your story. Your Taco Bell is no secret to right. the garbage well, garbageologist. Garbologist. Garbologist. Well, it's like you want to portray yourself in a certain way, yeah. right? Particularly yeah. to someone who an academic person who's interviewing you about what kinds of food you eat. You want it to look like you're healthy. So you're selling self-reporting is bullshit. Sometimes. <laughs> Most be. of the time. Can be, yeah. yeah. Um, and then they also went and did additional things where they did huge cores into um, dumps. What are they called? What is a trash dump called? Uh, landfill. Uh, landfill. There we go. I could not think of that word. Um, and there's actual stratigraphy in landfills. That's interesting. And it's so you get to see 90, 1980s garbage versus <laughs> you get to see the Atari games versus the uh, Dayglo and yeah. Yeah, and you know they used to be able to date the layers by the phone books because there would be people would throw out their phone books uh, yeah, yeah. and it was annual, right? You get a new one every year and you throw out the old one. And and um, anyway, the there is a video that I have. I don't. It's gotta be. It's probably online somewhere too. Bill Rathji is the um, archaeologist that started this project. It's pretty funny because he was a Mesoamericanist, and he's like, "What am I doing in garbage?" <laughs> I think it was one of those like small projects, local projects that then took off and became his major component of his career. Um, awesome. But he talks about, and he's dead now, but he's a, he was a wonderful archaeologist. He even came to my university that I was at previously, because my students did these garbology projects. Mm -hmm. And he came to give the keynote at this uh, research symposium we had for the undergrads. Oh, nice jump. And uh, I jumped two the barrels. The double barrel, that was beautiful. And, um... Oh, oh. Got cocky. <laughs> <laughs> you, you earned it for about thirty seconds. Right. There, that was beautiful. Um, and he so he came and listened to all my students' presentations that they did on their garbology projects, mm. and just gave them amazing feedback. It was really awesome because yeah, that's so cool. There's so much you can learn about garbage from garbage. So I had some students. Um, this is my favorite study. It's the one I remember the most. They it was I, they always had to partner up in twos or threes. Mm -hmm. So it was two guys, and this was at Middle Tennessee State University, and they um, looked at two different tailgating areas to see like like sports event tailgating for football. Wow. Um. So there was one area that wow. was like where all the students went. Yeah. And then there was the alumni booster tailgate area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they collected garbage after a tailgate while people went to the game. And then, you know, they they classified all the different types of things. And um, what they found was that the um, alumni area had much more expensive types of I was gonna say, alcohol, especially hard liquor. <laughs> that is exactly what I've <laughs> predicted. Right? And, uh, and the students, of course, had cheaper beer and whatnot. And, yeah, yeah. Um, it's blue label scotch versus natty light beer. Like, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> pretty much. I'm sure it was it was Jim Beam, though, right? Or mm. Jack Daniels or something. That's fair. Um, That's my cultural bias of how I influenced <laughs> that decision. <laughs> um, that is amazing, though. And they published it. They published wow. it. Wow. It's really cool. That is amazing. Oh, what? Oh, when did the bear ever come like that? sniped by Donkey Kong. Oh. And that is, that is such a fun, like, human behavior study, but it, it gives them context into, like, solving those 10,000-year-old mm -hmm. problems. That's that's how you do it, right? You have ah. to look at human behavior. That is amazing. Hey. Your son is still L. on. <laughs> He's like L. <laughs> Thanks, he, son. You didn't do the LOL, though. <laughs> that's not what it means. Yeah. <laughs> so right now, the middle school crowd, it's all about L for loser. Man, do you try to keep up with the, uh, the, the, the social, like... Uh, dynamics of your kids um yeah because they use it on me so yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what they're saying yeah no 
that's fleek or that's uh yeah you know there's like that, a progression fleek is not the word anymore well, well, but that's what's crazy is like how fast that's changing now mm -hmm. versus i mean ten thousand years ago you had generations of cultural things and now it's like every five years that blows my mind right does that terrify you in, in terms of future analysis of cultural changes it takes five years to be relevant Pokemon versus, you know, another mm -hmm. event. Um, the internet's so fast. It's, well, you know, and also think about how, I don't know, when I was growing up, we had, we had a TV mm -hmm. and we all had, my family had to watch the same show at the same time. And the same four channels, right? Right. Like, and, yeah. and on commercial breaks, you went to the bathroom or you yeah. got the popcorn. Um, and now it's like we can all be in our own bedrooms with our iPads or phones watching real drastically different types of media. Yeah, yeah. there's no water cooler conversation anymore. No, it's so different. There's no yeah. frame of reference, right? Yeah, like, yeah. I don't watch the same things as a lot of maybe you know my students. So like I don't get their references. They don't get mine. Uh huh. Well, those three worked out nicely. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt the conversation. <laughs> All right. I'm not get so, so I better catch up. So Reese's Pizza wants to know, my wife wants to know if there are any other cultural that cultures that worship cats, presumably this is referring back to Egypt. Also, Reese's Pieces, you don't have to add the qualifier that your wife wanted to know, because we all want to know these questions. Mm -hmm. Like, knowledge is power. Let's let's do it. <laughs> the more you know, G.I. Joe. Like, let's let's do it. So. Um, do they worship cats? I don't I don't know. If, I don't so, even know if the Egyptians worshipped cats, but they um, had cats as major players in their religion. Mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily mean they were worshipping them. Um, other religions, I'm not certain. I can't really. I'm, you know, I'm thinking like. I feel like there are Buddhist temples that um, care for cats, and it's not because they worship them, but they see them as, you know, sacred beings because they're animals and they're Buddhist and they don't want anything to suffer. Um, I know in Italy, it's in Rome somewhere, and I can't remember what it's called, but it's it's this old. It's like a. It's, oh, I know what you're talking Roman about. Ruin and it's no, no, no. Taking, it's, taking... it's where Caesar was stabbed to death. It's now a cat sanctuary. I saw is. this when yes. I was in Italy. I visited it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You can see it. You can see where Caesar got stabbed, and there's just like a hundred cats that just hang out now, and they're just stray cats that get fed, and they have a vet on site. So yeah, that's awesome. Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, does that mean that they worship them? No, but for some reason they've become important. Just like think about the Hemingway cats in yeah. the U.S. Right? Yeah. They have the extra toes or whatever yep and those are very special cats so i don't know people just like animals and they like to be weird man that's that was such a fun like just like i didn't know this existed and now it does right, <laughs> like, right? it was really cool i mean so, so relating that question like uh during that europe trip it was actually my wife and i's honeymoon we went to see the louvre obviously which is a profound like mm -hmm. i mean say what you will about like hijacked archives from other nations stuff like that but it is a profound museum what's what's your favorite museum what's the most profound like uh, boxed archaeological experience you've had um i have a couple mm -hmm. Take that comp. Every level is earned in this oh, game, no. ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Tanya is going to sleep well tonight because this is I'm exhausting. Have... <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, the... You're, you're going to feel this for the next four days. And I apologize. Right, pretty much. I did not. I send a lot of emails before the stream, but that is not included in the game. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it should be. <laughs> Come play games. He said it'll be fun. So. Yeah, no, no, you won't hurt for several days. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, sorry, museum. Favorite museums? I, I'm curious. What What is your? Too close. Um, the National Museum in Scotland. Interesting. Love that museum. Um, it, it's just it's an amazing space. It's 
beautiful. The lighting's amazing. The displays, the exhibits are really great. They um, so so that's like uh, like presentation or that's content. That both. You, it's both. both. It it's does both, both well. Yeah. Okay. Um, then the museum of the National Museum of the American Indian. It's fabulous. The Where's that? DC okay. in Washington D.C. Um, it is just fabulous. They they had um, they collaborated with different indigenous communities, um, and so all of the belongings and items and stories that are there are mm-hmm. was all the display of it is all guided by indigenous peoples, and so it really tells the story of of their tribes or their ancestors how they know it. I just find it fascinating. They also have a really good cafe there that serves um, all indigenous foods. I, I don't know if the sous chef is the wow. one who who runs it or maybe he just started it, but um, like how fun is that to integrate that into like the, the, the commissary? Like yeah. uh, they, they, they really like were very thoughtful. Yes. That, it's, it's amazing. Wow. So there's that one. Um, the, I can't remember the name of the museum in um, Vancouver. Mm-hmm. The, there's a museum in Vancouver that is also amazing. And it's, you know, it's full of um, information and objects that have to do with the Northwest Coast indigenous peoples. And it's just, it's gorgeous. It is, go- I just love, it. I love it. That's awesome. So those would be my favorites that I can think of right now. There are probably others. I mean, I lo- I'd love like- to hear this, like, uh, I mean, so, like, I'm a, I'm a genuine, like, inquisitive person, but I don't have the expertise necessary to evaluate what's good and what's bad. And so when I go to, like, the Louvre, you're just bombarded by everything. Mm-hmm. That's how the British but, like, Museum is. And, and it's, it's overwhelming because you, like, get desensitized to how profound this stuff is because mm-hmm. you're like, oh, another Egyptian mummy who right. gives a shit, right? right? The 25th one on the tour. But, right. like... To integrate your the food into the commissary is something that I've never experienced. That it, is that is amazing. And I'm sure when I go back and watch this YouTube video, I'll remember this and go back and visit it. <laughs> so thank cool. you for those insights. Yeah. Um, all right, so catching up on some questions. Soxtune, uh, first time chat. Thank you for joining us. Click the follow button if you haven't. It's awesome to have you joining us on stream. Do you have any info to share about ancient America cooking and eating utensils in our region? Knives, spoons, grinders. As someone who spends a lot of time in the kitchen, I'm curious. Does proximity to the coast affect those very much? Shellfish shells, more specific food tools. That's interesting. Like available materials versus utensils used. Like what is known about the ancient America? Um, okay, so yes, there are specific tools. Um, some are things that we might still use today, like mortar and pestle. Mm-hmm. Um, even manos and matates are still used today. And it, what is that? Sorry, um, I it's for grinding. That well, it was used for grinding corn. So it's um, the matate is the big like stone oh, slab, and okay. then the mano looks like a rolling pin, basically. Yeah. Um, so that's those are pretty important, and then um, oh no, don't come this way. <laughs> so you get we'll have to forgive Tanya. She's trying to answer these really profound scientific questions while playing Donkey Kong. <laughs> it's, a, it's a contrast in experience, and I, I hope you guys like go home and try to talk to someone while playing games and on a fundamental level, and it is very hard. You can tell I'm a mom <laughs> because usually I'm trying to do something and I. Have. Mom, mom, <laughs> 27 questions. Mom, mom, mom. Uh, sorry, G Man. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, it's actually, he knows it's his little sister. That's the one. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> that's always. No, like, this is ah. on YouTube forever. This is archived 10,000 years from now. Great. They will be judging you accordingly. Sorry, little C. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the legacy of the internet. Right. Yeah. Um, okay, so utensils. Mm hmm. Monos and matates, mortars and pestles. Very important. Um, were important. Of course, things like cooking pots were important. Mm-hmm. Um, I think one of my favorite things is our earth ovens, because earth oven technology is something that was was used pretty much around the world. And if you think about it, we still use oven technology today. We don't bear, necessarily bury our stuff. Although, if you've ever been to a pig roast. 
where they're like a Cuban pig roast, where they roast the pig in a pit covered with banana leaves. That's that's like an earth oven. Wow. And, um, you know, even think about if you have a gas oven or electric oven at home, it is, it's a box. Killing it. Right? That you heat up, mm -hmm. you put the food in, and you keep the, the temperature at a constant to cook your food. And that is what an earth oven did. They just dug pits. I love them. And I love that there are... You know, that's a, something that was, I don't say universal, because I don't think there are many universals, but um, it was definitely something that was a very effective technology that probably didn't require too much in the way of resources. And then <clears throat> a plug for one of the chapters in my book, Baking Bourbon and Black Drink, um, there is a chapter about earth oven technologies and how um, they served as what we would call something a persistent place and that people came back to them year after year because you already had the pit dug you had you know it was a special place for cooking you probably had a good reserve of firewood nearby and so people would return to these cooking areas year after year mm -hmm. which is pretty cool um and you know you can roast shellfish in them you can cook plant all kinds of stuff other types of cooking things would be like braziers, like um, ceramic braziers, which are like little three or four legged like grill type things. Uh -huh. um, those are pretty cool. I, think I mean, the utensils, like, I mean, you go to Japan and China, chopsticks are important. Like, is there a Native American equivalent, mm -hmm. fork, spoons, and something else? Interestingly, uh, no, not really that we know of. Um, it, oh, can't get it to move. Um, bye, Reese's Pieces. Yeah, Reese's Pieces, good night. Thank you, as always, for joining us. It's, it is a pleasure. <laughs> Hopefully your wife got her answer on the worship know, of cats. Probably, but... <laughs> well, Egyptian is the obvious answer, but right. like, no, the, the, the incorporation of animals is intriguing. Well, and they're an old world domesticate, right? Yeah. So, and by that, and I know that is also a very colonial term, but... It is um, a way that we use to describe different parts of the world. And so Reese's Pieces, I don't know if you were here earlier during the discussion, but dogs were first and then it was sheep. Sheep right? goats. Sheep and goats and then pigs and then I don't remember the... Pig and cow probably about the pig same time. Pig and cow, yeah, yeah. And then chicken. That's an, I mean, and regardless of continent, is that a, a similar timeline? Those are all old world. Okay. Right. So they're not the Americas. Mm -hmm. um, in the Americas, we have dogs. Mm -hmm. And in Mexico, Mesoamerica, they had, you know, different kinds of dogs that they, like sub breeds or subspecies, I guess, that they mm -hmm. domesticated. There's the Xolo, which is the Mexican hairless dog. So cool. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, and then there's also the um, Chihuahua, which was a uh, Mesoamerican subspecies. Mm -hmm. um, but then, Yikes. We also see... Turkeys <laughs> were domesticated in Mesoamerica. Yeah. Um, and then in South America, you have guinea pigs that were domesticated and um, llamas, alpacas were domesticated. They were beasts of burden, plus they provided wool, probably provided milk. Bummer. I mean, so uh, I'm gonna go on a tangent here. Like, so you have the zoo archeology, span I don't remember how you guys pronounce it. Zoo there's, archeology. span there's, there's also like this, this Xeno, genre of chupacabras and aliens and like cryptozoology yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, you, do, you, do you have to deal with that i mean you casual but like are there genuine researchers trying to propose chupacabra as a real thing like I think so. no that's not a that um, is just no, the, the I'm, unsolved I'm, mysteries contingent of archaeologists i mean i'm sure there are some people that believe all of that kind of stuff and mm -hmm. i've you know i've seen some of it online and whatnot um I kind of treat it as the same genre as Bigfoot. Yeah. Which apparently there was, there's like a Bigfoot. Oh, actually, there's a wonderful, amazing podcast on Bigfoot. <laughs> it's called Wild Thing. And it is, um, it's produced 
And the host is a former NPR journalist, and she's somehow, like, related to this anthropologist that basically started doing Bigfoot research and was pretty much ostracized like, because of it. did it a serious endeavor? or yeah. as a Wow. Oh my gosh, go up, go up, go up. I mean, so let's go down that vein. Like, what does it take to convince the community that something like this existed? You have to like, have the data. I don't know. I gotta look up the podcast stuff. Yeah, I, I give a link to the, the audience. First, in the it's kids the first season. I don't know what what the next seasons are because I, yeah. I just listened to the first one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What I mean. I mean, so 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 there. In in their defense, there are certain things that people claim to be real that eventually came out to be true, right? And like, there's examples of that where no one in the community believed until they started to believe, and it became standard. Like, like what? I I don't know for sure. Like the, the, we had this in the sciences all the time. Like the early people that did statistical mechanics and thermodynamics, they were ostracized from the community, and Boltzmann mm -hmm. like killed himself because nobody believed that he could ex describe thermodynamics statistics. And then he came out to be right. And so I guess the question is, is does that exist in your community? Was there uh, someone, you know, this icon of ostracism that came out to be right? Mm. Or is it just like the community kind of knows already? No, I mean, there probably has that I can't think of right now. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, thinking about like animals. Um, good night, Sock Sun. Yeah, thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Um... I was thinking like Loch Ness Monster. Okay, that's a good one. That's a fun one. Because it's like... It's, well, a, it's a very specific lake. Very, it's one location, right? Like scuba divers can answer this question. It's like where... What would be the proof that the Loch Ness Monster... Yeah, is? yeah what does it take? Yep. Um, is photographic evidence good enough? No, because we know that photographs can be altered. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, is it platypus who would believe it's true? Who would oh, believe platypus is real? Yeah. Um, but, you know, we have, even without the, um, living proof of a platypus, right? We would have the skeletons, like, and you wouldn't have just one of them. Yeah. You know, you have multiples. All right, we are on 1030. Are you ready for NARC? Yep. Let's ready do to it. Do this? Let's close out the night. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're not familiar with the stream, Ask a Scientist Gaming, we have mediocre gameplay with expert science. We close every single night with the game NARC, which is a bargain bin, really shitty game for the NES. That's the war on drugs manifest as a shooter side scroller game. So <laughs> Tanya is going to play this game for the first time tonight. Uh, not only that, before you press start, we are going to time you while you play this. In fact, I didn't warn you about this, but there's literally a clock that we're going to display on the screen Yay. and we're going to track in real time and you're going to play against your colleagues. Yes, I can tell it's a mammal by the uh, skeleton. <laughs> That's fair. All right. Press start. There's, a, there's your clock. Do you want to see the clock or should I put fine. it over here? Well, it's fine. I don't no, mind. None of this matters. <laughs> it's only a pride based thing. <laughs> it's also evaluated by the deans. Great. <laughs> Am I going to get a merit raise on this? Uh, you should. If you do well on it, absolutely, you should have earned it. Can you tell by the skeleton if it's a mammal? Yeah. So the answer is yes. So what, what what are the skeletal insights that describe mammal? Um. Well, mammal bones are can be very dense. They have, depending on which bone you're looking at, they have a very pronounced marrow cavity. Um, well, that's interesting. Like the degree of hollowness depends on mammal versus bird. Bird. I mean, yeah, think about a bird bone. They have dense. to be light, yeah, right, yeah. to fly. Yep. Get off me, dog. Versus fish. Versus fish. Yeah. Fish are just weird. They just <laughs> so weird. They they sink, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> they don't, but they look very weird. Yeah. Um, and then you know, turtles, reptiles, amphibians, all very different. And it's one. Of, that's what I'm trained to do, right? Like that's the kind of class I teach. Oh car door yep um is to learn you know teach people how to differentiate between the different classes of animals and at first it's very difficult especially because we look at things that are can be so fragmented um nice <laughs> 
pick that, that rock. <laughs> It's like you all are impeding my progress here. So, so how, how uh, along this bone, like uh, trying to like process bone structure into like creature, like when you see someone try to recreate a face or a height or things like that from a skeleton, like how do you feel about that? What is the? Well, with a, um, with height, yes, you can because there's there are some constants with. Um, how individuals grow. So that's like a femur versus overall height. Yeah, there's like a relatively you, well known. Yeah, there. Are, okay. Yes, there. Are lots of data on it, right? Mm -hmm. I guess I need to stop walking into things. Did I really just? No, no, no. I don't get to die. All right. So coming up here, you have to shoot these guys in black with bullets, and one of them will drop a blue card. And this is something called RNG. It's random number generated. I don't know what controls it. If you touch both buttons and you shoot the dogs, they will turn into puppies and they will get away from you. So hold both buttons down, you can get rid of the dogs, and then you shoot the guys in black with bullets. And the bullet is B or A? It's holding A. That one, so yeah, shoot the blue guys. There you go, blue card for the door. So hit the door slot. A little bit right. Oh, a little bit further right. This is Nintendo jank, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually pretty quick, so <laughs> that is a <laughs> consolation. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm distracted. So I'm about, like, two Long Island iced teas and, like, one beer in, so I apologize for not <laughs> keeping track of a lot. <laughs> you are the unique scenario where my guest is not getting drunk with me, so I'm in the, the embarrassing portion of the spectrum. That's great. <laughs> Let me tell you, I, this is way past my bedtime, so I feel I, slightly punch drunk. You know, I feel a little bit bad. It's one of those things I've weighed, like, in terms of timeline. So you want to capture West Coast plus, like, when people are, you mm -hmm. know, open. But we've also discussed, like, what night do you do this on? So if you go down to that car and tap B, you can jump in it and stay at the bottom of the screen and it'll take you a certain distance but it's like i don't want to take my scientist friday or saturday night away like wednesday night is seem pretty have? innocuous so tap it a little less time there you go there you go <laughs> huggy beer so so yesterday is when i learned what a long island iced tea is so so tanya said she wanted to drink a tea and she talked about the what was the the black black what, drink black drink so that's a form of tea essentially right it's soaking yeah. a plant and, and steeping the leaves. and i was like okay I'm, I'm gonna get drunk even though tanya's not going to and so i said long island iced tea is the answer i learned that it incorporates vodka plus gin plus tequila plus what a stupid invention and 10,000 from years from now, they will know how dumb that is. But right now I have to deal with it in terms of not being sober. Yeah, Long Island iced tea. Ooh. It is something else. I, I had a bad experience with that. <laughs> it's just one. Not a caffeine. <laughs> how do All I right. get through this? Do I climb so it? So jump. Tap B. So it's a very, so gentle touch of B. We'll get you in the air, yep. Just do that right next to it and press right. There you go. Well, so realistic on the feet. Yeah, it's the alcohol. <laughs> Huggy beer, I won't take that as a personal judgment. <laughs> what's What's fun is some of these people on stream like Huggy beer have been here regularly for about a year and they know me very, very well. <laughs> and so mm. at this point, you can see the drunk Ken taking over. But Tanya is taking this game seriously right now. So. I am so sorry. <laughs> I'm very competitive. You can either jump over or go down the bottom. I respect that. Like, like, let's take our gameplay seriously. <laughs> so, uh, if you guys have questions, we have about a half hour left. Uh, Tanya pa Paris is happy to answer questions about uh, archaeology, in particular related to uh, ancient Americas and how animals influence behaviors, whether it's through food consumption or through. Um, how they influence culture in terms of like uh, ceremonial or whatnot relationships. Throw your questions in there now. So one of the things I like about alcohol is it like puts the inhibition down and I just like spew words and sometimes they work out and sometimes they don't. Yeah, the thing about Long Island, uh, Long Island iced teas is that they're not actually iced tea. There's no, 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 absolutely not. That's always like yeah, no, it's quite shocking the first time that you drink it. I mean, it's just because they're kind of brown looking. No, no, it's like there's sugar water plus a bunch of alcohol and yeah. like, yeah. 
All right, let's do a couple of our more standard questions. Um, what about a prediction? Oh, God, I forgot about predictions. I apologize because you spent a lot of time. I didn't ask this. <laughs> well, that's awesome, though. Like, you, you see how they facilitate a dialogue, which is pretty funny. Um, do, 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 which one do you want to do? Ooh, Huggy Beer has redeemed a request a factoid. Do you have a knowledge bomb you want to drop? And you could use any of these factoids or any of these predictions to do so. Oh my. Or your factoids. It's totally up to you. But Huggy Beer wants you to drop some archaeological knowledge. My mind is now blank, thanks. <laughs> While you walk, right? <laughs> Walking right there. Walking. Um... It's really far from my microphone. We'll do this one. So, um, maize, which is corn to us, right? Maize is the, what we call indigenous corn, um, is a domesticate, but it was created not because humans purposefully bred, set two different species of plants together. It's because of hybrid vigor, which is basically like a happy accident. Um, and we know that one of the ancestors of maize is teosinte, which is a grass or cereal. Um, and the other one, I, we don't know what it is. We ha I think people have some ideas of what it could be, but they don't know for sure. So that's kind of cool. Like, and early maize is like little tiny, little tiny things that don't even look like corn. They must look like a wheat. Um, and yeah, it's grown into like this thing that kind of powers the world what is that black thing uh it's apparel keep going to the right you'll find a car at some point so hybrid vigor i've never heard this terminology before but it, it, it's genetic engineering but not through a understanding of genetics just in terms of the like it's just like it happy happened. accident yeah and that that was i mean people have known about like you know hybrids and like breeding and stuff i mean how how far back does that go i think we have corn back at like 9,000 years ago. I mean, what's insane about that is your casual farmer knew, like, didn't know, like, explicitly, but knew intuitively that DNA existed. Like, in terms of this, this hybriding, this cloning, and this behavior, that blows my mind. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Because they also were, you know, observing, paying attention to things. Yeah. I mean... How many of us just go sit outside and like observe the birds or the squirrels? Yeah. And I mean, so we, we touched on this earlier with the domestication of dogs, right? So there was a certain genetic selection to the point where it was speciation. So casual speciation is uh, the offspring can't breed, right? And that took, you know, tens of thousands of years, which is mind blowing to me. Yes. And that's called was the terminology hybrid hybrid bigger and that's accepted that's a archaeology term or that's no, a that's biology a one. Term. that okay that's interesting i've never heard that one before all right so while you fight the murderous clowns one of the other favorite questions i like to ask besides the movie and tv and whatnot is if you had unlimited budget and no moral qualms what research study would you do? <laughs> <laughs> and so, so we're gonna disclaim that. I, like again, you can you can say anything you want, reckless, recklessly dig up whatever you want with an unlimited budget. What do you? What would you do? And we're talking trillion dollar budget. This could be like lidar of every single square foot of the universe. Like what? So you grab that card, go up. Don't don't press up anymore once you go through the door. Pacific Plankton, welcome to the stream. I saw earlier you were up. You were you were well, doing some I'm TM going right managing. and nothing's happening. Uh, go left. Sorry. Oh, I see. Yep. That, that's Get one away of the from few me, clown. Yeah, murderous drug clown. Don't you remember this from Dare program when we were young? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Gosh, so long ago. Um, what would I do? That's such a good question. I. I mean, I can't say I don't would not answer along the lines of no moral qualms because that's a huge issue, right? Yeah. Ethics is a huge issue in archaeology. Absolutely. But I would. Um... So you're gonna go left on this level for no apparent reason. <laughs> because they're trying to change it up. Yeah. Um, 
to the cows on the other side of the farm. But uh, to briefly, briefly intervene, Pacific Plankton, welcome to the stream. We actually, I, I was trying to explain to Tanya that there is a community beyond just video gaming on Twitch streams, and we used your stream as an example in terms of using, I think you used TM to visualize Plankton, so thank you for joining us. It's great to see you on stream. So you're going to have to shoot the, gra the uh, ramble looking guys, so yeah. not this one. So you're going to use bullets to shoot that guy, and one of them is going to, there you go, green card, go to the door, you're good. So yeah, Plankton, it's great to have you on stream. We really appreciate what you do on Twitch in terms of science outreach and imaging things in real time so people can see microscopic things. All right, I apologize. Tanya, no moral qualms. I mean, so, so, so this is a hard question because it's like, you know, like if you could abandon that, because especially for like psychology researchers and things like that, there's mm -hmm. human experiments that you'd love to do that would never be approved by any IRB. Mm -hmm. Like if you wanted to gain that knowledge, what would that look like? Hmm. No, this will be on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking. I mean, no. I would. Jeez. Oh, these stupid clowns. Augie Beer, you are right. Tanya is having really good luck with the blue card and green chart. So, so Tanya, the dirty secret, if anyone wants to reveal it, I was the world record speedrunner in this game for about a year. So oh, I, wow. I ran this game faster than anyone in the world. And two of the hardest parts in this game are the blue card drop and the green card drop because they are statistically random. And you've done very well on both of those. So congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Sorry, I'm going to let you answer this question because it's important. It's important. But I mean, you know, there are lots of things I could answer. But I think right now... Um, I would want to go to Scotland yeah. and excavate more Cranog sites. What, what is that? I don't yeah, waiting for you to ask me. <laughs> you, you, you poisoned me for that question. <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> um, come on, dudes. Where's my red card? So you have the red card. I apologize. Yeah, so you picked them up on the way. Competitive. I appreciate this. Mm -hmm. You're taking this seriously. Um, okay, so Cranogs were, or are, I guess, um, circular timber structures. So think circular houses on very stout timbers that were... Um, built over locks or lakes in Scotland and people lived in them during the Iron Age. Mm -hmm. And it's not known if they were, you know, people lived in them year round um, or always during certain times. And, you know, were they defensive? Of course, I mean, it was actually a really good place to live. You're pretty safe out on the water. Um, but there have not been very many in Scotland that have been fully excavated. And there is one, um, that I did a little bit of research at one summer. It's called, ooh, hello, Oak Bank Cranog. So if you hold down both buttons, yeah. you can get rid of the dogs. Turn back. You didn't know you'd be shooting dogs tonight. But at least they turn into cute puppies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so if you look up Scottish Cranog Center, it's a museum that um, they built a reconstructed Cranog near the one that they excavated. And it's underwater, right? And it's in these very cold Scottish lock waters. So you have to wear a dry suit to dive in it. And um, it's, you know, probably certain times of the year because you have to have good weather. But come on, dog, get off me. All right, so you're going to have to shoot the guy in the wheelchair with a rocket. Talk about no moral cost. <laughs> Perfect timing. <laughs> so squat and shoot the dogs, hold both buttons, and then you're going to tap A to shoot the guy in the wheelchair because he's a drug dealer, and that's fine. Come on, dude. Where you at? So shoot these guys. Shoot the blue guys. He'll appear at some point. There you go. That's one. So you need two more shots on the guy in the wheelchair. <laughs> so Tanya didn't know prior to today that she was going to be playing NARC, so this is a spontaneous 
All right, so Scottish, I just sent a link uh, talking about the Cranogs. So that that's, uh, you want unlimited budget to excavate? Mm -hmm. More of them, because there's more in the lock that have never been excavated. Uh -huh. And there are more in other locks. So I'd want to survey all the locks. Pay, actually, I'd want to pay someone else to do the work. Yeah. Um, I mean, so unlimited budget, you could like drain pools of water. Would not do just, that. No, no, really? no. Really? That's no. interesting. Because it's still, I mean, people, they're, it's a it's a lake. Like you don't want to drain the lake. No moral qualms. Uh yeah, no, I wouldn't do it. All right. So that's like underwater <laughs> well, excavation. Yeah. How do you? Yes, because the thing is, once you drain the water out, then everything is going to start to deteriorate immediately. I see. I see. Yeah, yeah, it's preserving it. This is so hard. Get away from me. So, so are you familiar with the Vasa in um, Gothenburg, Sweden? Mm -hmm. the, the, it's a ship that sank in fresh water, and it was preserved for 300-some years. And it was for that exact reason, right? It was underwater, and it didn't have any oxidation, right. and it just, like, didn't have the bacteria. Like, that's that was eye-opening. That was one of my favorite museums, actually, because of that reason. And so you'd preserve them under the water, but at some point extract them through... Ex underwater excavations. Man, that has got to be an endeavor. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Tanya's focused. All right, Pacific Plankton has a question. Can I ask what a... Oh God, I pronounced this wrong. What is zoo... Zoo Plankton? Zoo Archaeologist. What is... How do you... Zoo Archaeologist? Zoo Archaeologist. Zoo Archaeologist. Zooarchaeologist. Zo right Zooarchaeologist. Pacific Plankton wants to know because I love zooplankton or zooplankton. A zooarchaeologist is someone who studies animal remains from archaeological sites. They can be macro remains, they can be micro remains, they can be um, you know, bone, shell, teeth, hooves, horns, antlers, shrimp mandibles. And so the key here is like zoo refers to animals in Latin or yes. something like that, yeah, right? And so zooplankton and zoo archaeology. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, no, it's been a fun journey talking about like especially early Americas and how animals influenced that. So yeah, yeah, that is exactly what Tanya Paris does. So if you have any questions related to that, zoo archaeology in particular in the Americas in terms of how they influence uh, either our dietary consumption or uh, cultural influence in terms of our behavior and how animals influence that. Um, have you, and throw your questions in chat, we're happy to answer. And does it go down to bacteria size? That's a question, like what is animal definition for you? It can. Um, I don't do that, but there are people that do insect, insect. zooarchaeology. Uh huh. Um, and you know, even things like stable isotope analysis of absorbed residues, looking for lipids and proteins of certain kinds of animals in um, ceramic pots to you know determine what kinds of food people were eating, based on you know lack of evidence mm -hmm. or. Because it's, I, I used to call it indirect evidence, but it's still direct evidence. It's just a lot more uh, involved to get the evidence. Come on. Oh, that's that's perfect. So tap A. You have seven sixtieths of a second to tap A. <laughs> there you go. Oh, go back right. Go right. He's gonna drop a key. Right there. Left. 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 There we go. Left. Oh See my that gosh. Orange thing? I'm trying. Yep. Sorry, if you go too far right, it would despawn it and you'd be soft locked, which means you can't beat the game. So, all right. Pacific Plankton wants to know how do we preserve history? I mean, in your, your domain, I mean, we have people building parking lots over this, you know, valuable information. Well, what's, what's your advocacy for preserving that history? Well, it really depends on what is threatening the history, right? Um, I think that. So you're going to go to the top of the screen and you're going to jump and shoot rockets at him. So maybe run to the far right. Get off me. And then what you're going to do is you're going to turn around, tap jump, and then tap rocket. And you're going to shoot a rocket at his hat. Which is the rocket? Uh, tap B and then tap A. Yep, and it, it's one motion, and this is one of the hardest parts of the game right now. So get a good distance away. 
like go to the edge of the screen. Yeah, oh no, this is going to be very frustrating and I apologize. This is a bargain bin game that I forced my guests to play. <laughs> Especially after a night of exhausting science and it's other games. Game. <laughs> no, that's true. <laughs> you're, you're at least sober. All right. Um... Ooh, wow, Huggy Beer. So could zoo archaeologists, zoo archaeologists be tr tapped to look from past life on Mars or other planets? They could, but I don't know what they'd be looking for. I mean, presumably spores or something. Yep. Come on, Batman. I yeah. get too excited and I press too hard. Yep. So tap B and then tap A while you're in the air. That was very close. Man, that is intriguing, and I learned about this when I was uh, in University of Southern California. We're close enough to the uh, what is their NASA's research facility in, in like the Pasadena area, but like they were just looking for spores and things that represent spores, like per particular shapes, fossilized, and things mm -hmm. like that that are spore-related things. And it's it, it's a very archaeological, but also geological. Yeah, it's a very hard. I mean, and this has been a, a strong debate, like the earliest life on Earth. I don't know if you're familiar with these discussions, but like, is a shape that looks like a bacteria enough to define life? And it's a very contentious debate. And if you get sick of this, let me know. I'm, I'm, I'm going to beat this. <laughs> All right. So walk away, turn around, jump. Oh, that was close. I don't understand why it's not firing when I'm in the air. It, it might be you're pressing a little bit too long. It, it, it's literally, and we, we broke this game down fundamentally, it's seven frames. So you get seven sixtieths of a second to turn turn a uh, tap into a rocket. What is he throwing out of his mouth? That is his tongue. Oh. So did you go through the D.A.R.E. program? Were you part of that yeah. like generation of yep. absurd drug processing? This game is a byproduct of that bullshit. I mean, you have teenagers now. Do they still do dare? Do they still do drug awareness? They call... That's a good question for G-Man. They call it teen safety matters now, and I think it covers more than just drug awareness. It's probably also like cyber stuff. Hmm. Well, my favorite part about the D.A.R.E. program is scientifically it's been shown over and over again that it is detrimental to decreasing drug use. And one of the things they did fundamentally wrong in D.A.R.E. is they tried to treat all drugs as equally bad. So marijuana is just as bad as heroin, according right. to D.A.R.E. Oh, there you go. Okay, so you're going to walk away and you don't have to jump anymore. You just have to turn back and shoot him in the face. But that was problematic, because when a teenager takes marijuana and they're like, this isn't that bad, well, clearly heroin's okay. All right, so now you're going to walk away from him. You have to be somewhere in the middle of the screen rather than top or bottom, and you're going to shoot bullets back at his vertebrae. And that's going to break the vertebrae over time. So bullets holding the shoot button rather than tapping. Yep, and you're just going to move up and down, and sometimes it's going to break vertebrae, sometimes it won't. It is a very stupid game in how they programmed it. All right, so going back, uh, the preserving history. I mean, is there, like, going back to that pet peeve question, is there something you see in the community that they're, like, actively damaging history by the way they do things? Well, okay, so there are certain laws, right, that protect some of history, but not all of it. Mm -hmm. And um, it would be nice if we could make it more universal. So, for instance, archaeological sites are only protected if they are on publicly held lands. So state properties, federal properties. Oh, that's interesting. Um, if it's on private land, it's not protected unless it has human remains. And then that triggers a whole other set of laws. Huh. Um, so think about all the developments that are going on around Tallahassee right now. That yeah. are privately, private lands, private developments that don't require federal funding or permits. They do not need to um do anything about the archaeology that's there so as long as they don't find a body it's just like put that dirt pile here regardless of what's in it mm, yeah they don't even stop to look <sighs> so i mean knowing that the Appalachian lived here yeah um so you're gonna want to go that way stay in this like that region turn back and you'll shoot 
and sometimes it'll work and keep walking because you have a bunch of a leeway to do it. <laughs> Sorry, Tanya. Is, is this more or less frustrating than Donkey Kong? <laughs> um, a little less, I think. So yeah, go down and walk further, and then keep doing that. Like it's turned back, and you hope you shoot a vertebrae. So it's like, drugs are bad, but guns are fine. <sighs> yeah, that's another debate. All right, we're into the restroom again, but I'm going to give you a question before I go. What's your favorite equation? I guess that's the question. How often do you deal with equations? I mean, isotopic ratios, obviously that matters, but in terms of formalizing it in terms of mathematical relationships, how much does that impact your field? That is a terrible question. <laughs> <laughs> So in terms of mathematical equations, I use a lot of simple things like ratios and um, I did get one. Do I have to get them all? This is stupid. Um, but uh, we there's one that we um, use. It's the, I do have to get them all. Thanks, Huggy Bear. Huggy Beer. <laughs> I like that. Um, the I like the Shannon Weaver function, which is a allometric regression formula that we use to determine biomass of animals based on the skeletal remains that we have. Huh. Um, so that's kind of cool. I also like the species and diversity, species diversity and equity or richness um, measures. Those are pretty cool. Sorry, I just caught the end of that, but bones to biomass, is there like a... a oh, that's a great title of something. Yeah, no, isn't it though? Like, is, is is there like a like four to one ratio? Is there a... Rel there you go, go right, you're gonna find a door. You did it. I did it. <laughs> it's non-trivial. Is there a, a relatively standard relationship between that, bones to biomass? There is, um, and it's the one, the stuff that information that we use with the um the data the comparative data is from the florida museum of natural history wow. um because so you're gonna go right this last this is civil forfeiture the level where you steal all the gold from the drug dealers regardless of due process <laughs> you don't have to grab them just go speed run <laughs> i'm trying to speed run if anyone has suggestions on someone we should raid uh tanya is about to win the war on drugs and beat narc so <laughs> we'll we'll call it a night fairly soon if you have suggestions on who we should raid throw them in chat right now we're happy to visit a few different people so that is it sorry i, I went late on this the time the, is this the game this is the end so here's your congratulatory <laughs> do you feel like you achieved something tonight <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right. If anyone has suggestions as of uh, people we can raid, typically we do science related people, but if there's anyone else, feel free to throw them in chat. We're happy to do it. Um, Tanya, congratulations. We had a journey. We went through Galaga, Donkey Kong, we played some Super Mario, played some Space Invaders. Uh, you got to revisit a lot of the classics, but we also learned about a, a lot about anthropology and archaeology and how those things relate. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining me. You took Thanks. a cold email from a crazy <laughs> lunatic that said play video games and play ask us or answer questions on science on Twitch. Um, but thank you for joining me. Do you have any closing comments for the audience? Um, thank you for having me. I would do this again. It's really fun. And um, audience, you can find me on Facebook or I think it's Tanya M. Paris, archaeologist and author, is my Facebook. Um, Twitter is Foodways Arc, A R C H. And 
I think that's all I have right now. Yeah, and te check out the uh, About Us page on our, our, our Twitch stream because all the links to Tanya's uh, major contributions, you can find those there and you can look her up. So yeah, uh, Tanya, thank you very much for joining yeah. us. It was a pleasure. You were our first anthropologist. It was, it was great to have you on. I learned a lot. <laughs> I really enjoyed the discussions and the gameplay. Great. <laughs> it's frustrating, but it's a lot of fun. It so. is. I know. I feel like it was a good stress relief at the end of this wacky semester. Absolutely. So thank you very much. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, anyone just joining us, Ask a Scientist Gaming, every two weeks we have a guest on. On May 24th, 8 to 11 p.m., we're going to have Marty Swanbrow Becker. And so he is in the Education Department of Florida State University. He does educational psychology, in particular suicide prevention and teen suicide prevention. He wants to do evidence-based counseling to address that. And so we have a lot of video gaming and levity, but that, I mean, that's a heavy topic. So it's going to be very interesting to have Marty on and discuss us, you know, really like teen suicide, which is a growing issue to to address. And so, again, it's 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 going to be an interesting topic to discuss. But Tanya, thank you again for joining yeah, us. Thanks. Everyone that's been on stream, stick around. We're going to raid somebody. We have a suggestion, Mister Hor Horologist, who actually fixes clocks on stream, which is kind of fun. So Pacific Plankton, thank you for the suggestion. That sounds awesome. Um, thank you all for joining us. Your questions really make the stream an awesome time. We, we go down a lot of rabbit holes and discuss a very interesting <laughs> topics. So uh, thank you all, as well as thank you, Tanya, for joining us. Um, until next time, again, we really appreciate you viewing us. Thanks.